Then we'll begin with the preamble. Um, so in compliance with notification requirements of Ohio's open meeting law under COVID-19 emergency declaration, notice of this meeting has been publicly posted. All boards and commissions under the purview of the city planning department conducts its meetings according to Robert's rules of order. Actions during the meeting will be taken by voice vote. Abstentions from any vote due to a conflict of interest should be stated for the record prior to the taking of any vote. In order to ensure that everyone participating in the meeting have the opportunity to be heard, we ask that you use the raise hand feature before asking a question or making a comment. The raise hand feature can be found in the participants panel on the desktop and mobile version and activated by clicking the hand icon. Please wait for the chair or facilitator to recognize you and be sure to select unmute and announce yourself before you speak. When finished speaking, please lower your hand by clicking on the raise hand icon again and mute your microphone. We will also be utilizing the chat feature to communicate with participants. The chat feature can be activated by clicking the chat button located on the bottom of the WebEx screen. All meeting activity is being recorded via the WebEx platform. These proceedings are also being live streamed via YouTube. We have provided a link to the meeting for those who wish to speak on a particular case via our website and email. We have also received emails from those who have provided written comment on a particular matter. And with that, Chair, I will turn it over to you. Okay, um, before Michael starts calling the roll, um, everyone that's gonna uh, present today, I will ask you to be concise, quick, so we don't lose a quorum during this meeting. Obviously, you need to cover all the pertinent uh, information with us, but uh, please be quick. And also announce yourself, your name, what organization you're with, or your address, so we know who's speaking. Um, Michael, call the roll. Bowen. Yes. Present. Downing. Present. Fluker. Present. Curry. Present. Paul. Stami. Present. Life. Present. Mr. Chairman, we have a quorum. Thank you. The first one um, is a special presentation for public art for Freedom's Joy Banner. Who's here to speak to this? Um, David, um, I'm going to recuse myself for this one because um, I have a conflict. Thank you, Lily. Good morning, Commission. This is Sarah Petras, the public art coordinator for the city. This project for Freedom's Joy Banner is a collaboration of uh, Shooting Without Bullets Executive Director and Founder Amanda King with uh, Midtown Cleveland and Land Studio. It was approved by the Euclid Corridor Design Review Committee uh, yesterday with conditions to study increasing the size, um, ensuring that when it's affixed to the brick that they uh, use the mortar joints and for the installation of the frame as opposed to um, drilling holes in the bricks and that they move the banner placement to align with the seals or lintels um, and move it up a little higher on the building. Um, I completely support this project. I like the location. I like the message. And I am going to, I think it'll have a positive impact on the community. And with that said, I'm going to turn it over to Amanda for her presentation. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, I am Amanda King. I am the artist who created the, the Joy Billboard along with veteran photographer and experimental filmmaker Robert Banks. Many of you probably know him as an educator at Newbridge Center for Arts and Technology. Um, this was a collaborative effort, but um, the initial um, For Freedoms project, I put the link in the chat, was a four billboard project um, that launched last November. Now it launched around the holidays, so a lot of Clevelanders didn't get to see it, but it got a lot of national and international coverage because the Guardian did a seven minute documentary and they actually, um, with Four Freedoms, commissioned the billboards. I'm proud of this project because not only did we get social messages, social justice messages out there into the community, but we also worked with all Northeast Ohio artists, many of them under 40. And um, we produced some really interesting, thought-provoking, high-quality billboards. 
Um, due to the fact that not a lot of people were able to see the billboards, I approached land in Midtown and said, hey, I have this one particular billboard, the Joy, the Joy billboard um, that moves me and I believe should um, have a semi-permanent location, especially in a community that um, that needs to be uplifted, that needs to be encouraged, that is going through a whole lot with the racial inequity and injustice in the city, with poverty, with schools closing and everything like that. But that was in 2019. We're talking 2020 in COVID doing at a time when there are, you know, racial uprisings. I think it's very important for our communities to have artwork that speaks to their experience, that speaks both messages of empowerment, but also joy. And I believe this billboard infuses both. Um, and so here is the artwork. Um, this is the artwork that will be trans uh, that will be transformed into a banner. Um, joy is a form of resistance. It'll have the Four Freedoms branding on there since they were the original partner. Uh, Four Freedoms has approved of this new use of it. They're very excited to see something that's semi-permanent because a lot of their installations are quick, temporary for the moment. You can go to the next slide. The location is the A1 building on 71st and Euclid. Um, I don't, I, I'm, I'm a person that commutes, so I, I walk to all of my locations and um, my uh, office is in Midtown, so I do walk by this building and I'm really excited to animate this particular strip. Um, the RTA goes by it, I'm, I'm oftentimes on the RTA and even just to be looking out of the bus window and to see something like the Joy Banner um, can really uplift some spirits in the community. So. So this is this is where it is. This is an old photograph. So a lot of the signage and branding that's in this photo is not currently on the building. We can move to the next slide. Here's a map of Midtown. I don't know how helpful this is to you. It's certainly not that helpful to me, but um, I we do have Joyce here from Midtown who can tell you a little bit more about the location if you would like to um, if you'd like to hear from her. I think we all know the location. Perfect. So we'll move on. Um, the next one is the actual mock up, I believe, of the uh, Joy Banner. It's about uh, 23 feet by 11 feet, I believe. And um, as Tara mentioned, we did go before Euclid Planning Commission yesterday. And um, we talked about moving the billboard, moving the banner up um, closer towards the window sills. I don't know if you can see the window sills up kind of at the top of the building, but moving the, the billboard up um, to be a little bit more easy on your eye. And so the position of this billboard in this mock up is not quite correct. Um, how it's going to be installed, like Tara said, we can move to the next slide. It will. Uh, the company West Camp that we're working with will be notified as to not damage any of the surface of the building when using the um, fastening process and um, putting the locking strips. Um, we know that the banner is going to be semi permanent, and that probably is like a three to five year run, depending on. Um, I guess the use and function of the building as as that evolves and. Midtown has graciously um, has graciously offered to be the steward of this, and um, Land Studio is obviously um, a, a wonderful collaborator that I've worked with on several projects. But Joe is also on this project and is is really um, ushering the install process and is here to answer any questions that you may have as well. We're going to use um, heavy duty vinyl with no finishing. That's really all I have. Thank you. Commission members? I move approval incorporating the suggestions from design review. I second. Paul? We have a motion and second. Further discussion? Hearing none, uh, please call the roll. Bowen? Yes. Downing? Yes. Blueprint? Yes. Paul? Yes. Slide. Yes. 
Motion carries. Good luck. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, zoning map amendment. It's an unnumbered zoning um, ordinance changing the use area height districts of parcels of land west of East 105th Street. Um, between Mr. Cedar and Quebec. Mr. Who's Chairman, Mr. Chairman, I have to recuse myself. Thank you. Uh, Shannon Leonard, City Planning. Maurice, can we go to the next slides? Uh, so the purpose of this rezoning is really just to consolidate several zoning districts to align with the citywide 2020 plan as well as the Innovation Square uh, redevelopment master plan. Um, you may be aware that our um, new form-based code uh, pilot project that we're working on does address this area. Unfortunately, that um, code will not be available in time for the projects that are moving forward at this location. Um, so we really just want to promote sustainable site design by addressing both East 105th and Cedar at the node um, at that corner. We really want to activate it to ensure that future development includes diverse housing typologies as well as a mix of pedestrian or oriented neighborhood retail uses. Um, next slide, please. Um, so the current zoning that's currently um, at this location on this corner where we are proposing the rezoning is a mix of two family residential, multifamily residential, uh, local retail business and residence office. Um, as you know, two family allows one and two family, multifamily allows one, two and multifamily. Um, local retail is your neighborhood retail and residence office is a mix of um, office space and residential as long as you're not selling or doing any type of wholesaling or storing. Uh, next slide, please. This is the proposal here. So we're proposing at the corner for it to be limited retail business down East 105th to be also limited to retail business, but within the interior of the neighborhood where there's lots of vacant land to be multi-family residential, and then adding an urban form overlay um, along the outline of Cedar and East 105th. Next slide, please. So I'm just gonna walk you through each section. Uh, this main section here on the corner of East 105th and Cedar, we are proposing limited retail business F3. So this will fix a zoning issue between residence office and local retail. As you know, with split zoning, it always defers to the most restrictive. So this entire parcel, once these parcels are consolidated, would be considered residence office. Um, we really want this to be able to match with the Innovation Square Master Plan. I believe there's a proposal here to put a large um, grocer or store, a retail store with some apartments um, or townhomes. And basically, we really want to activate this corner. Um, as you can see on the right hand side of the screen, these are just your existing views of a parking lot at this corner, a church and a few vacant parcels. Next slide, please. The second section here down East 105th set south of Wayne Court, uh, we're proposing limited retail as well. This will ensure that the future development meets that master plan, but also to be within neighborhood scale and offer diverse diversity in neighborhood retail but also some housing, while at the same time uh, excluding some of your nuisance uses that are typically allowed in a general retail business district. Um, in the middle of the screen, you can kind of see what the uh, current plan is. There may be some tweaking. There's some proposals for some residential buildings with some neighborhood retail along the bottom along East 105th Street. Next slide, please. The next section here in green, we are proposing multifamily residential. This is really to replace two family residential to align more with the neighborhood character um, is also to promote appropriate and flexible info housing so that you can have a variety of housing options, town homes, um, single family, two family, multifamily, but also serve as a buffer between our retail sections and our more interior streets that are more two family and single family in nature. Um, next slide, please. And the last section here is we're proposing an urban form overlay. And this is really to ensure that any of the new development will activate that corner um, to the community will create a high degree of walkability. It'll require pedestrian oriented building features and it'll enhance our public safety by minimizing conflicts between our vehicles and pedestrians. As we know that East 105th and Cedar is quite uh, a large intersection. Uh, next slide, please. 
So this is our proposal. Again, going down the road, the form based code will address this neighborhood. Uh, but because we want the new projects that are going in here with the market and the new housing typologies, um, we are putting forth this rezoning as a fix to the, the proper site design that's sustainable, walkable, um, and really fits the character of this neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you. Is the councilman on the call? Or is you, Sam? Um, he, I do not. I don't think he is, but he did submit a letter of support. This was a partnership with uh, neighborhood planner Kim Scott, um, representatives from City Architecture, Fairfax, and um, the councilman. Thank you. Um, this is a public portion of the meeting. We're going to hear from opponents, those people in favor of the zoning change, and then we'll hear from opponents, those people against the zoning change. So, proponents, people in favor of the zoning change. Please use the raise hand feature and we'll call on you. I, right now I have no hands raised. Opponents, anyone against the zoning change? We have Kim Scott would like to speak. Kim? Good morning. Um, Denise Van, I don't know how the function of the raise hand uh, works, but uh, I just want to make you all aware that she is she is here on, on behalf of Fairfax Development. All right. We, have, we do have a D Van Leer that would like to speak. Right. Okay, go ahead. Good morning. <laughs> um Denise Van Leer, I'm the director of Fairfax Renaissance Development Corporation. Um am in support of the zoning changes. Uh, we have been working in this area for many years and our projects are teed up uh, and soon ready to be implemented. Um, so I'm very much in support of the zoning changes. Thank you. Thanks. Anyone else in favor or against? I have no other hands raised at this point. Okay, the public portion is closed. Commission members. I move approval, Downing. Second. second. We have a motion and a second. Further discussion? Hearing none, call the roll, please. Bowen. Yes. Downing. Yes. Curry. Yes. Paul. Yes. Slight. Yes. Motion carries. Uh, conditional use permit, pedestrian over retail overlay district. This is for permanent parcel number 11405019. Uh, 842 East 185th Street. Shannon, are you doing this one too? Yes, I am. So good Go morning, ahead. Shannon Leonard, City Planning. Um, the proposal here is to establish use of the property as a 3,742 square foot daycare center with 10 employees. Next slide, please. Um, so as you know, under the pedestrian retail overlay, a daycare is considered a institutional use as defined uh, in our code. Uh, next slide, please. So the proposal here initially, before it went through design review, uh, was to add the daycare here with the entrance on the rear, um, you see on the left hand side of the screen what the initial proposal was and on the second side of, on the right side of the screen you'll see the new proposal i think it's also evolved a little bit more since it's been through design review uh, but they have moved the uh, front entrance to east 185th street um, as well as has worked out the play area so there wasn't the um, traffic issue in the rear um, next slide please so again, this is an institutional use. They simply need a conditional use for the institutional use. Uh, essentially, the subject building was designed specifically for this type of use or denial of the application could result in long term vacancy or the proposed use is needed in the immediate area and suitable alternative locations are unavailable. The uh, property owner at this location is the applicant here. It is not a lessee. Um, it is my understanding and Mr. Howe or uh, Sharonda for the neighborhood 
could, could um, engage a little bit more on this, but it is my understanding that this building has been vacant for many years. Um, and this is a proposal in which a daycare center actually wants to go into a retail corridor versus in a house in a residential street. Um, but I'll let them expand upon that a little bit more. Uh, next slide, please. So again, they really just need the conditional use for uh, the institutional nature of a daycare center. I believe Sharonda is here from city planning as well as the applicant and the architect, Mr. Howe. Okay, who wants to go first? Mr. Howe or Ms. Watley? I can go first if, if that's okay. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, Sharonda Watley. Um, I'm the neighborhood planner for um, this area of the city. And so um, this project did go through design review just earlier this week. Um, it was approved in terms of all of the exterior modifications that needed to be made. Um, they did ask that they consider an expanded play area just for additional circulation for the kids and things like that. Um, I do, I am under the impression that um, the council person as well as the CDC are supportive of this conditional use to establish the child care center here. Um, that it is also my understanding that Ms. Hill, um, the property owner, has had this uh, space for many years um, and it has been vacant. And so we are all very excited to see a very active use be returned back at this location. And with that, I'll turn it over to Mr. Howe or to um, the property owner. Thank you. Okay, Dave. Mr. Howe? Yes, this is Dave Howe. Hey, David. You want something to add? Um, simply, uh, the building has been uh, vacant for 11 years. Um, Shinata Hill has owned it during that time, been unable to lease it. She's the operator uh, um, of two other uh, daycare centers, um, has been in the field for 22 years, I believe. Uh, she's an experienced operator um, and decided to add a third location here. Um, in terms of the elevation that I'm looking at, um, uh, daycare centers require a certain amount of glass, which we have on the on the front. We've also added some uh, window uh, vinyl, as you can see, those colors to brighten things up. Um, when I think of children, I think of color, and um, that's part, probably mostly responsible for the fact that we've, we've put those in. The sign, uh, <clears throat> learning to grow, also picks up the colors. Um, you earlier saw that the front of this uh, building is all boarded up, which has been uh, maybe the last eight years or so because people were breaking the, the glass. Um, the brick, uh, we want to stain so it's a little lighter color. Uh, the brick um, looks dated, frankly, and it's just part of wanting to brighten the whole the whole thing up. Um, that's pretty much it. Unless there's some questions. Thank you, David. Uh, commission members, I move approval. Lillian, second. Downing. We have a motion and second. Further discussion. Call the roll, please. Bowen. Yes. Turning. Yes. Booker. Yes. Curry. Yes. Paul. Yes. Slight. Yes. Motion carries. Lot consolidation lot splits. Permanent parcel number 0040960. This is at 2053 West 13th Street. Who's here for this? We have Wesley Harper. Wesley. David, how are you? Good. How are you going to dice this one up? Oh, this one's simple. <laughs> this is like the architect's vegematic. <laughs> this one, you guys, real quick. Um, we okay. are on the uh, 
uh, eastern uh, portion of Abbey Avenue, just south of uh, Kalowski's. Um, uh, so we've got uh, nice views downtown uh, uh, over the valley. Next, please. Uh, here we have the existing context uh, starting in the upper uh, shows the site. Um, the site is actually uh, uh, currently the side yard of one of the townhomes uh, that line east or excuse me west 13th place. Uh, so basically what we're doing uh, if you go to the look at the slide at the upper right you can see it's a, a line of townhomes and so that northernmost townhome basically has a, a side yard that's uh, 47 feet. Um, and so uh, the idea is to split off that side yard for a development site. Uh, down at the lower left, you can see uh, the view kind of to the Northwest. So uh, as I mentioned, uh, is just across the street. And then at the bottom right, you can see uh, we're bounded by uh, West 12th plate uh to the east and then there's uh, basically garages that line that little alley and then a single family house uh further to the east at the corner of 11th next uh so here's the existing uh condition of the parcel uh mentioned it, it be the northernmost townhome uh site and then you have the empty portion of the parcel uh, you can see the, the existing town, townhome to the west, and then uh, an existing garage to the east off of West 12th Place. Next. Uh, so the idea is to uh, split the lot right at the demising line uh, of the existing townhome uh, and open that up for a development site. Uh, the house that we're showing here is just uh, a concept. It's not the proposed design, but it's basically just to show what's possible on the site. Next. Uh, so just from a, a scale standpoint, you know, this is kind of what's allowable or, or, or basically the maximum build out uh, in our opinion. So the idea is to uh, advertise this uh, for the uh, developer, put this on uh, the MLS site. Uh, and sell the land uh, for uh, a project. So, uh, next. So this is just again uh, a, a design concept that could take advantage of uh, the expansive views to the north uh, uh, for a residential uh, development here. That's really it. Um, if you have questions, uh, happy to answer. Thank you, Mr. Members. For, um, I think, procedural question, um, I'm not opposed to this. I think it makes sense to have this development here, but we, as a matter of policy, don't split lots without a proposal um, like this. So I'm just curious if, um, the, from, I guess, the administration's point of view or Freddie's point of view, if he's on, I mean, we're basically speculatively splitting a lot not knowing what is coming here. Yeah, that was my concern too, Lillian. How many units? What are we? What are we doing here? You know. Yeah. So we I mean, my to come back for design review. Right, but but I mean, this is just going up on the MLS to sell a lot for whatever is possible here. So, um, you know. I understand the dilemma, which is it's is on this, but I, I mean, we don't do this in other parts of the neighborhood or other parts of the city where people are just speculatively splitting off lots. Um, if I could speak to that, the uh, the idea would be to build a single unit. Uh, uh, the I believe is is two family. Um, but, uh, you, know, you can't really market it without it being split off, but knowing that that would be, uh, like, you, you could actually, because you could market it 
so that the sale was contingent on approval of the plans, which is normally what happens, right? So somebody wants to buy this lot, the, the you know, the contract of the sale of the lot is contingent on city approvals or lot split, and that's more in line with what would be normal. Um, uh, yeah, I, I'd say it's probably 50, 50. I mean, we've, uh, I feel like we've done this process before in this sequence. Yeah. Chairman, we have, uh, with Chairman, we have Matt Moss. Oh, we got a lot of feedback. Go ahead. Get your microphones if you're not speaking. I believe that's Kim Scott. Thank you. You said Matt? Yeah, Matt Moss. Uh, had so, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to inform the commission that the zoning on this location is uh, multifamily B1. So, that permits small multifamily housing and also permits townhomes based on our townhouse code and single family and two family homes. And, you know, if the commission is concerned about the design, uh, I believe you could approve this with. Uh, on the condition that it received design approval, either from HDRS or from the planning commission itself, depending upon what the final project ultimately ends up being. Keeping in mind that uh, projects that are five units or less are generally approved administratively and projects that have six units or more have to be approved by the local committee and the planning commission. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chairman, we have uh, Councilman Slife. Councilman. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm, I guess I, I appreciate both points. You know, it's, it's we, we don't want to uh, change the, the legal boundary of a property on speculation, but also someone might be reluctant to hire an architect or to really seriously consider any type of project without some degree of comfort that the lot split could take place. So I'm just in, in I'm wondering if there's a middle ground kind of comparable to how in design review we have projects come in conceptually before there's final approval. Is there value in not necessarily voting on it per se, but showing that we're receptive to the idea or another idea of, you know, not allow whatever motion, not allowing this uh, split to be um, finalized until a project does come back, but at that, that, that point, at least the surveys could be done and what have you. I'm just, I, I'm just trying to think if there's a, a way down the middle. So, Councilman, that's a, a good suggestion. I think what could happen is it could be a sense of the commission members uh, of a development like this being uh, acceptable and then tabling it um, for an actual proposal to come back. And if it's within this realm, then it's a kind of a no brainer if the commission members are in a agreement that this would be an acceptable uh, design or use. And then um, they could come back with some certainty that they would get approval. If it varies from this dramatically, then they're obviously taking a bigger chance. Mr. Mr. Bowen, we have Mr. Harper. Go ahead. Um, you know, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't, uh, you know, express the concern from a, the, the developer's side. Um, you know, it, it, it's it, it'd be di more difficult to to market this uh, project without it being split. Um, okay. The idea, the sequencing of things would be that the developer would would sell the parcel to the uh, the client, let's say, and then the builder would work with that client or the architect would work with that client to produce a project that's um, uh, that would then come to you. So I guess from a, a sequencing standpoint, it, it, it causes a problem. Um, for the developer, if it's not officially split, because typically the the, develop, the the seller of the parcel is out of the picture by the time uh, um, it's a small parcel. There's really uh, limited uses that can occur here, so I, I guess I would just question what the risk is of uh, of, of not splitting it. 
now and, and waiting for the eventual proposal. Mr. Chairman, we have a uh, director Collier with his hand raised. Go ahead. Thank director. you. Okay. So a couple of things uh, I want to point out. Uh, one, this is not necessarily the norm. Um, the uh, conversation that we're uh, having right now and the point that uh, Ms. Curry brought up uh, is a legitimate one. But what it boils down to um, is now what is the map? What's the matter of policy as to how we handle uh, situations like this? So I think this, uh, you know, really brings this to the forefront. Now we have the authority, um, as indicated um, uh, by Mr. Slife as well as Mr. Moss, to uh, make a determination uh, and be able to um, be fluid um, if we so choose. But if we do that, uh, there will be other cases uh, like this where we would have to make a determination. So I think what we need to get square on is really what is going to be uh, the policy moving forward. Um, understanding the concerns that have been raised, but typically uh, we would see the full development uh, as part of the rationale for why the parcel needs to be split. Um, I'd like to make a motion to table. Um, uh, before, before we do that, uh, Khalid Hawthorne from Fremont West had his hand raised. I just wanted to see, make sure we get everybody in. Yeah, and I just wanted to uh, tell everybody I appreciate the level of uh, conversation that's going on with this. I think it's come up with previous lot splits and potential developments, and it's something that we do need to come up with a, a policy that I think can be streamlined to a certain degree uh, as far as the uh, design approval and the lot split may be happening together or something along that lines. But uh, I appreciate the level of uh, conversations going on here. And uh, Yes, uh, we're uh, we haven't formed an opinion on this uh, as far as the uh, tree mine is concerned, but uh, definitely want to continue the conversation. Um, so I'm, I'm going to make a motion to table, but with the uh, message to um, you that we are open to uh, the development of this parcel and welcome to see it back. But when there is actually a plan for this site. Um, so, motion to table until there is an, a site plan. Second, down there. Motion, motion is second. Uh, further discussion? Um, um, I have to get a sense of the commission members. If, if this was the proposal, would you be in favor of approving this lot split? I mean, my opinion is 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 in plan, yes, but it, it needs to go through the local design review. It's definitely larger in scale, and and I'm okay with that. But it has had no process, so uh, I think it's hard to 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 ask us that. I mean, we are open to the development of this for a house, and so we need to see the design before we answer that. That's my opinion. Okay, call the roll, please. Mr. Harper, I believe had another comment. Wesley, yeah, I, I'm really kind of baffled by the the, the thoughts on this, but um, yeah, it, I, don't, I don't see why it couldn't be uh, handled through the design review process. I mean, this creates a hardship for the uh, the developer um, in waiting for the proposal. I mean. If this was a proposal, it would, of course, go through that process where any concerns could be heard. With that, I'll, uh, I'll defer to, to the process here. All right. Thanks, Wesley. I would suggest that they hire you and it will go fast. <laughs> uh, call the roll, please. Easy one. Maybe not. Bowen. Yes. Downing. Yes. Luker. Yes. Curry. Yes. Paul. Yes. Life. Yes. Motion carries its table uh, for a uh, proposal. Current parcel number 0041706824652465 Tremont Avenue. Who's here for this one? And now we have the other principal from Horton Harper. We have Michael. Good morning. Good morning. Okay, so um, the proposal here for a lot split is uh, for four new single-family homes off of Tremont Avenue 
you can see the site uh, at the bottom of the aerial here, um, primarily single family homes. Uh, we are in a multifamily district uh, on the opposite end uh, of Professor. It's a two family district. And um, you can see the site here on the top image uh, where you can see that existing curb cut um, in the tree to the left and some uh, buildings in the background that will be removed. However, the idea behind the, the site plan, which you'll see in a minute, was to preserve the tree in the tree lawn, preserve the existing curb cut to maintain uh, street parking, and to preserve the existing house to the left of the driveway. You can go to the next slide, please. Here you can see that uh, the existing conditions that we were just looking at in that view. So you can see that curb cut uh, to the left here off Tremont Avenue that kind of starts to, to curve toward the back and then open up to some existing uh, buildings that will be removed. And then the existing house there uh, that uh, fronts Tremont Avenue. Can go to the next slide, please. So here you can see our proposed site plan. Um, again, we're keeping the, uh, one single curb cut. We're adding a one car garage to the existing house. And then we're creating a pedestrian walkway um, that uh, kind of leads you to some of these residences that are toward the back. Um, so there are uh, visible sight lines uh, from the sidewalk that can uh, direct you to the entrances. And so the front two, uh, you know, their entrances face Tremont Avenue and the, uh, the, the rear single family homes, um, their entries, uh, face professor or toward the east um, and the idea is that the green space in the back and that the pedestrian walkway that we're creating um, will um, help to identify how to uh, read and access those entries. Uh, the single access drive uh, takes you to two car garages for all of the residences. And then uh, next to the existing house, we also have a uh, green space that will you know, continue, you know, we'll develop that further as we move forward the process. But uh, uh, the entire site plan, uh, this process in general was guided by uh, conversations with Tremont West, uh, particularly in, in you know, an effort to keep the existing home, uh, keep the existing curb cut and keep the existing tree along the tree lawn. And um, this has been presented to the block club, at least the, you know, um, the con conceptually um, what this is, what we're showing, and you know, they had uh, some conversations about the height of the residences. So that's what we're working on now. Um, you know, to help you know bring gable roofs uh, to these and to bring down the roof lines. But uh, for now, this is just for the parcel split, and um, you know, we think we're being sensitive to the scale by making these single-family homes in the back and um, maintaining some of the existing conditions along Trinidad Avenue. That's all. Open to questions. Thank you. Commission members. I mean, this is for me highly unusual. Um, so two difficult ones. Um, not entirely sure that, that this is either what we meant by the townhouse code or the um, Sort of how to split parcels on a single family lot, which is a, you know, but I mean, if the community really wants it and the block club is okay with it, you know, I'm, uh, I'm just, um, I, I, I guess I, I asked the, the, administration and Freddie, you know, if this is, um, sort of, kind of add this in my opinion to the complexity of of where the townhouse code has gotten us so um, i mean i'm open but but mr chairman with matthew moss go ahead man. mr chairman just to clarify i don't think the townhouse code applies here because these units aren't attached so these would be reviewed as single story single family homes under the zoning code and Mr. Chairman, we have Director Collier and then August Fluker. Yeah, so a, a couple of things that you know I want to uh, say, and uh, obviously, uh, the uh, on the 
commission in uh, in, in our community uh, with respect to you know uh, urban design, etc. One of the things I do want to uh, mention is that you know we're trying to uh, ensure that there's uh, flexibility in lifestyle housing in our neighborhood. What's that going to require is uh, some recalibration and rethinking about how we uh, configure lots, uh, the type of products that we're putting in our community, and not being so uh, rigid, for lack of a better word, uh, with respect to uh, this notion of uniformity. Um, we do want to be flexible, and this is important how uh, we're seeing uh, some of these um, sort of alternative layouts and alternative products that are, are being presented that we're entertaining. Now, obviously, I'm going to emphasize the word that we're entertaining. Um, obviously, you know, the boards and commissions have to make their call, but from an administration standpoint, to respond directly to Ms. Curry's uh, comments, you know, that flexibility is something that we are open to. Um, just given the times that uh, we're in and given the types of neighborhoods that we want to try to see um, in our city. So that's the rationale for why you're seeing some of the variety uh, of approaches that you're seeing uh, with respect to uh, housing product. Fred, I agree with you actually a lot, but the question for me that this commission, why this commission is here and and is that we have to ask the question that for every 60 foot lot in Tremont or Ohio City or where there is a strong market like this, um, we now, we, we've created a, a, a pathway that every single lot could build four units like this in the backyards uh, across the neighborhood. And if we're okay with that, it just opens the door for every single person to sell the back of their lots and develop them like this. And and it's it not that it's just a one off and it's not a problem. It's just a policy that we're setting. And I'm asking this commission to think about that policy a little bit because um, I'm not entirely sure myself. I want to see every lot do this in Tremont, Ohio City, Detroit, Detroit where there's a, a market to sustain this as a policy. So. Um, it's not that I'm opposed to flexibility or different ways of living because I'm not. It's just more about um, the fact that I don't want to see a hundred of these. Right. Mr. 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 Go ahead. We have uh, August Fluker, Khalid, and Director Collier again. Um, okay. I, I to the commission members. What I what I see, at least what I'm reading from this this map or this site plan, that there's there's some there's some context here that this already exists. To the down Correct. below. I mean, so there's there's houses that are already, you know, from a historical standpoint, that's what traditionally um, some of these lots how they were configured. So I don't, from that standpoint, given the context, um, I don't necessarily have an issue with this. Obviously, if it were foreign to to the neighborhood, then then I, I think I would I would agree with Lillian. Mm. Um, but there's there's something here. There's precedent there. Yeah, I agree with you, August. And and there's not a lot of lots that are left like this that you could do this with. I mean, you just look next to it and they're kind of full. So, all right. Uh, what's next? We have Khalid uh, from Tremont West and then Director Collier again. All right, Khalid, go ahead. Yeah. So uh, just uh, piggybacking on August's point about the context. Yes, uh, historically, there have been front back houses. Uh, especially along this stretch. These are pretty deep lots. Um, and also, I guess, as additional context of what's been approved in the last several years, there, as you see there, uh, if you could keep going down the street, a lot, there have been a lot of new construction, two, three, four houses built back to back to back. So uh, there has been a new context put in place, I guess, over time. Um, I get uh, also uh, regarding the points of the commentary from uh, the block club, uh, Michael brought up a few points. There was one additional one and uh, which uh, at some point we have to, I know they, they made an attempt to add some green space in here uh, based on some probably comments that we've had with them before. Um, but uh, 
not necessarily pertaining to this, but other lots in the future, uh, we end up paving over uh, all of the lots with no green space. Uh, so all the benefits that we have from a sustainability standpoint are taken away from impervious surfaces and then uh, no space for people to enjoy private, uh, privately with their families and things of that nature. So that's uh, one thing we need to take into consideration in the future on uh, as we talk about these types of lots. Um, yeah, and so uh, th those are in the end. Uh, the what's driving the density per se a lot. I don't know if it kind of goes hand in hand, but there's a lot of land speculation, and as the prices go up, people have to, are attempting to put more and more uh, units per lot to cover the costs of lots, which are getting 175 to 225 in some in some cases. So, uh, and I guess uh, you know it's a lot a lot of conversations that need to be had, especially around the. Uh, uh, tax abatement, which drives it as well, and the uh, potential three hundred thousand dollar cap. But I just wanted to add that piece in there as well. Thank you. We, we have Director Collier. Yes. Director. Yes. Thank you, uh, Chairman. Uh, I just want to say briefly, um, uh, Lillian's comment doesn't fall on deaf ears. But part of what I want to um, start articulate here is that um, being able to be flexible means that we're looking at these case by case basis. August spoke to the context of this neighborhood, which uh, is appropriate in this particular situation. Um, and I understand not wanting to see the proliferation of this type of scenario everywhere. And I think that is where, you know, the discretion of the commission and the safeguarding uh, with respect to looking at each case on its own merit, you know, comes into play. So I don't want the commission to ever feel trapped uh, whenever we approve something that makes sense for a particular parcel in a particular space. And I just want to just emphasize that. Thank you, director. And we have no other hands raised. Commission members, what's your pleasure? Does the councilman support? Do we know? I don't believe that. This has been reviewed by the councilman. Not to my knowledge. I, I, I do want to add that I, I do want to add that this this proposal would not be appropriate on any on just any street in Tremont. Uh, there were comments previously about uh, this this particular street, its depth, uh, its unique width, and um, that there have been. You, like if you can if you can see this uh, 15 foot access and utility easement that's that's kind of below here between two existing houses there are a number of new homes in the back of this lot and then and there's a drive that kind of turns all the way back it, it would have been maybe appropriate to show that before this um had i realized this would fall under as much scrutiny as it has but um this this particular stretch of street is unique in its context, and uh, we're not uh, implying that this is something that you could do uh, at any given block in the neighborhood. You're almost, uh, if I can, Maurice, uh, Mr. Chairman, you're almost taking advantage of what the, the, the area gives you. And I, I think it's an asset based approach when you, you look at it. You know, you're, you're taking advantage of the uh, uh, layout and, and parcel configurations here, and you're leveraging that. You know, and I think there's a lot of merit to that in this particular context. Okay. So, commission members, what do you want to do? We have to move on. I, I move to approve the project as presented. We have a motion. I'll second. Stami. We have a motion and a second. Further discussion? Hearing none. Call the roll, please. Bowen. Yes. Downing. Yes. Booker. Yes. Curry. No. Paul. Yes. Slight. Yes. Motion carries. Uh, good luck. Thank you. Mandatory referrals. The first one is an unnumbered ordinance authorizing the director of public works to lease space at the Earl B. Turner Recreation Center 
Uh, this is located at 11300 Miles Avenue to jumpstart. Who's here for this? And we have Suzanne DeGenero. Suzanne, you're thank, on. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, Suzanne DeGenero with the Office of Capital Projects Division of Real Estate. So this legislation would authorize the Director of Public Works to lease approximately 1,700 square feet of space at the Earl B. Turner Rec Center to Jumpstart Incorporated. And we do have a couple of representatives from Jumpstart on the call in case any questions come up about the program. Um, Jumpstart has been working with, uh, with um, the financial support of Verizon to create neighborhood-based learning centers um, which include at Urban, Earl B. Turner Rec Center, this will include a computer lab and classroom space. Um, and as part of the initiative, Jumpstart will uh, renovate uh, the area. This You can see the area in red on your screen. Um, they will undertake renovations to the leased space, um, which will include, and if we can go to the next slide, Michael, I can show you specifically uh, what the renovations will entail. Their plan is to remove the wall between rooms one and two to open up the space, which is where the computer lab and uh, classroom space will be. And in addition, they are planning to open up the wall between uh, room one and the lobby to create an entrance to the center. Um, and they will lease areas one, two, and three and also the little area marked S, which is storage space, but the hallway will not be part of the lease space. That will just be renovated by Jumpstart, um, but will remain open. Um, it's, it's a really great program, and uh, it, we're one of four cities th uh, throughout the country where this is being done right now. Um, so we, we think it's a really great initiative. Thank you, Suzanne. Commission members? Approval, Downing. Second. We have a motion and second. Further discussion? Call the roll, please. Bowen. Yes. Downing. Yes. Luker. Yes. Curry. Yes. Paul. Yes. Life. Yes. Motion carries. Hey, Order David. Um, I'm going to recuse myself from the next two uh, next two agenda items. Okay, same thank here, you. August as well. Okay, thank you. Uh, ordinance number 822-2020, authorizing the Director of Capital Projects to enter into one or more multi-party agreements regarding East 66th Street uh, Roadway Improvement Project. Who's here for this? We have James DeRosa. Jamie, you're on. Hey, good morning, everybody. Jamie DeRosa, I'm the Commissioner of Real Estate for the City of Cleveland. Um, I only have two slides. I know you have a full agenda, but I do want to give some context to this um, piece of legislation. Uh, for many years, it's been envisioned that East 66th Street would be a gateway into the Huff neighborhood and also to Historic League Park. Um, and as we know, in 2014, Mayor Jackson invested $6.3 million into the restoration of League Park, including converting the ticket house into the Baseball Heritage Museum, expanding the park for the full size of the block, and then restoring the baseball field. Um, this laid the groundwork in addition to many other efforts to renewed interest in the East 66th Street corridor for investment. Um, and we now have investment planned along the corridor um, from various entities, including the Cleveland Foundation's headquarters, uh, planned for East 66 between Chester and Euclid. On the same block, we have investments planned by Midtown Cleveland and Dunham Tavern. And uh, we have a new library branch, the Cleveland Public Library Huff branch, planned for East 66th Street and Lexington. And new housing, such as the Allen Estates, which is planned for East 66th Street, just north of Linwood. So after a multi-year community engaged TLCI planning study going back to 2012 and then re-engaged in 2020, and with all of this new development planned, the city received a request 
to enhance the E66 Street roadway through an improvement project aiming at strengthening sense of place and building community within the Huff neighborhood. So this particular legislation will allow the city to study design elements that have been pre presented and suggested by the community through this TLCI study so that the city can determine the scope and the limits of this improvement project. The goal is to go as far north on Euclid Avenue as the budget will allow. And um, if I had a pointer, I would kind of point out the intersections here, but you know, basically you have Euclid to Chester to Huff to Lexington and Linwood on either side of League Park and then Wade Park and then Superior to the north. So the next slide here shows the elements of the um, legislation. And again, this is all related to agreements and contracts for the design of the project. The Cleveland Foundation has graciously awarded $250,000 for preliminary design. And we're seeking planning commission approval to move forward with this legislation related to the design of the project. Um, Rick Switowski and I are here to happy here and happy to answer any questions about the scope or design of this project. Thanks, Jimmy. Commission yep. members. I move approval downing. I second Paul. Motion is second. Further discussion. Call the roll, please. Bowen. Yes. Downing. Yes. Paul. Yes. Slight. Yes. And uh, Kurt and Fluker both left the table. Motion carries. Ordinance which is unnumbered, authorizing the Director of Capital Projects to issue a permit to E66 Street LLC to encroach into the public right of way. Who's here to speak to this one? We have Rick Swatowski for the next four of them. Okay, Rick, you got yourself cornered here. Thank you very much. Good morning to everyone. And uh, Rick Swatowski, I manage the Engineering Construction Division in the Mayor's Office of Capital Projects. Well, today, the first item is the East 66th Street encroachment. Uh, the project development site area is approximately 82,000 square feet. The site is within Cleveland's Huff Midtown District on an unimproved plot adjacent to the Dunham Tavern Museum. The proposed 50,500 square foot building will be the home of the Cleveland Foundation. Oops. I think we got the wrong one here. Well, that's the right one. I'm sorry about that. Anchoring the corner of Euclid Avenue and East 66th Street, the project is envisioned to be a significant office building of three stories, including private offices, workstations, conferences, spaces for clients and community use, community public areas, building amenities, as well as commercial tenancy on the ground floor. The consent form has been acknowledged by Council Member Bashir Jones. You can see in the yellow the areas where the, the first one around the building, that's for the, uh, the foundation. And the other one, the smaller one to the far right, that is for the uh, duck bank that will be put in. Move approval. Second. Motion is second. Further discussion? Call the roll, please. Bowen. Yes. Downing. Yes. Paul. Yes. Slide. Yes. Thank you. Uh, good luck. And, uh, Curry and Fluker both uh, left the table for that one too. Okay. The next one is ordinance number 824-2020. And this is to give consent of the city of Cleveland to the director of transportation of Ohio uh, to improve various intersections in Cleveland under the pedestrian safety improvement project. Thank you. ODOT will arrange for the preparation of construction plans and specifications, including engineering reports, and for the supervision and administration of construction costs and contribute 100% of the eligible costs. The pedestrian safety improvement project within the city of Cleveland includes enhancements to the pavement markings, signage, roadway features, and signalization. The roadway features consist of the ADA curb ramps, curb extensions, refuge islands, reducing curb radii, 
and the signalization consists of rapid flashing beacons, new pedestrian countdown signals, and upgraded pedestrian countdown signals. These enhancements are part of the ODOT's initiative to improve pedestrian safety on or adjacent to highways within the state. There are 61 locations with the city of Cleveland being improved. Um, the schematic you see tries to show them all, understanding they're kind of compressed given how many they are in a large area of the city. And the price of this project is estimated at $1.6 million. Move approval. Down. Second. Fluker. Motion and second. Further discussion? Call the roll, please. Bowen. Yes. Downing. Yes. Fluker. Yes. Yes. Paul. Yes. Slight. Yes. Motion carries. Resolution 831-2020, declaring the intent to vacate portions of Morrell Court Southwest. Go ahead, Rick. The request for a vacation of a portion of the remaining Mural Court comes from the resident at 3822 Clybourne Avenue, the abutting property owner whose lot the alley runs behind. The requesting resident would like to fence and secure the area behind his garage. This alley hasn't been used for access as, and is is a dead end and overgrown and no longer needed as a public right away. Move approval, downing. Second. Slide. Motion and second, further discussion. Call the roll, please. Bowen. Yes. Downing. Yes. Fluker. Yes. Curry. Yes. Paul. Yes. Yes. Motion carries ordinance number 442-2020, authorizing the director of capital projects to issue a permit to the board of parks and the Cleveland Metro parks to encroach into the public right of way uh, on River Avenue to install, use, and maintain an asphalt all-purpose trail. Go ahead, Rick. Thank you. This is a key trail connection in our city that helps realize part of the city of Cleveland 2004 waterfront district plan, 2007 Cleveland bikeway master plan, and the 2014 bikeway implementation plan. Specifically, this project is a key remaining piece of the trail network that will fill the <laughs> it runs from Mulberry Street to the Wendy Park Bridge. Uh, this 700 foot long trail connector project and associated intersection and sidewalk improvements will enable access from the lakefront at Wendy Park on Whiskey Island to the towpath via the Cleveland Foundation Centennial Trail and to the other Tiger funded trail projects in Cleveland. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, the legislation was amended. There were a couple of minor issues there. It, it originally said uh, River Road, I believe, instead of uh, River Avenue, and, okay. or maybe it's vice versa. And then the, uh, the legal description needed a minor change, so they, they just rewrote the entire legal description. Uh, so we are seeking approved, approved subject to stated amendment. Thank you. Members? Move approval of subject. Stated amendments, downing. Second. Uh, motion in two seconds. So this one will pass nicely. Um, <laughs> call the roll, please. Bowen. Yes. Diane. Yes. Luker. Yes. Three. Yes. Paul. Yes. Slice. Yes. Okay, motion carries. Ordinance number 839-2020 uh, to amend section one of ordinance number 832-2020 past October 21st, 2020 in order to extend expiration date of a temporary expansion area program from June 1st, 2021 until November 1st, 2021. Uh, who's gonna speak to this one? Yeah, Director Collier. Director. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the uh, commission. As you all know, uh, COVID-19 has uh, put some extra strain on being involved uh, uh, retail uh, dining establishments in the city of Cleveland. Um, we have put together the uh, T 
TEA or temporary expansion area program to help support these businesses um, throughout the summer, um, which allow for them to have expanded patios uh, into the public right of way. Um, there are some specific uh, changes that have been made from the administrative side to ensure that operations expand into the winter, but they do so in a uh, safe fashion. The legislation uh, before you allows for the expansion of the program to extend to June uh, 2021. I do want to uh, be clear with the commission that the um, administration has put together rules both the summer program, which uh, pan very successful, um, but we have also established the rules and regulations for the winter program. Um, and I want to be very explicit with respect to the R uh, because the legislation reads very broadly. Um, so, scroll down to the next page, Peter, please. I want to be uh, explicit about what the winter program covers in the pre program, uh, it covered uh, public right-of-ways or main streets. The winter program will not allow for the uh, expansion areas to extend on our major thoroughfares. Uh, one, due to inclement weather conditions and the fact that snow plows and other things will need to navigate those streets. It will be allowed on um, uh, secondary streets, parking lots, and plazas. As you can see in item one, parklets, which actually extend into the public right of way, will not be allowed for the reasons met. In addition, there is a uh, component of this program, unlike the summer, that looks at the uh, prospect of allowing for uh, enclosures uh, to be utilized by businesses. And Maurice, if you can go to the last page just so you can see the images of what we are allowing, um, I can give you some context uh, with respect to uh, the use of these um, uh, facilities to cover up uh, individuals who would be using these outdoor things. Uh, you can just go to the last page. This shows you um, the type of uh, outdoor um, covering uh, mechanism we are allowing. Um, to assist these businesses. So, um, when you read the legislation, it reads for the continued use of private parking lots, streets, and other public right of way, including on street parking areas and parklets as outdoor restaurants. That language uh, for the winter uh, is not necessarily correct. It's the rules that's going to govern uh, what we are able to do in those spaces. And these rules are. So I would like to uh, recommend um, or um, put on the table um, these rules to accompany any further discussion of the legislation. The administration is obviously in support of this. Uh, council is in support of expanding the program, but the specifics with respect to the rules of the program um, need to be uh, clear and adhered to uh, with respect to this legislation. So, Mr. Chairman, if we need to amend the language, um, again, the language just basically extends the uh, existing program, understanding that the winter program is different from the summer program for the reasons mentioned. Well, we could we could do an approval with state amendment. Okay. Um, Freddie, I got a question for you. So West 25th yeah. Street, obviously, because of plowing and everything, those barriers go away. Those Correct. didn't seem used almost at all, um, and especially now. I, I don't see anyone ever using them. Um, well, when are those the, coming down? The, the ones on 25th, there should be, be being removed sometime this week. Um, the expiration okay. date for the current program was November 16th. So uh, the public works department is going around doing all of the main street barriers and removing barriers for those who are not renewing their uh, their applications. So again, this gives them the option to uh, extend into the winter season. It gives them the option to put up enclosures, the enclosures of a specific uh, type. Right. Okay, thank you. Commission members? 
move approval with the stated amendments, Downing. Second, Curry. We have a motion and second. Further discussion? Yeah, just those amendments will be specific to the actual uh, three uh, things that we will have for. And we will uh, submit that language uh, prior to moving to uh, back to council. Thank you, Freddie. Uh, call the roll, please. Bogan. Yes. Downing. Yes. Booker. Yes. Curry. Yes. Paul. Yes. Slight. Yes. Motion carries. Ordinance number 856-2020 authorizing the mayor and the commissioner of purchase and supplies to acquire and reconvey properties presently owned by WRB Partners LLC or its designee located at 1648 West 9th Street for the purpose of entering into the chain of title for a TEF. Who's here for this? We good have uh, so. Uh, actually, good. Uh, actually, good morning, Commission members. It will be Rob Brown um, presenting. Okay, Rob. Project. <laughs> good morning, uh, Project good Manager morning. from Economic Development. So, WR Partners um, is proposing a redevelopment project located at fourteen sixty eight West Ninth Street. And in order to assist the project financing, um, the developer is proposing um, a 30 year non school TIF for the redevelopment of the property located at 1468 West 9th Street. The project will create 85 new full time jobs and as well um, retain 90 full time jobs. Uh, this project will rehab approximately 40,000 square feet of office space for multiple new tenants. And it would allow the building to go from 50% lease to over 90% of lease space. Um, the total project investment is um, going to exceed approximately 13 million. And the piece, this piece of legislation will allow the city of Cleveland to enter into a chain of title for the TIF. So if there's any further questions on this, I, um, we do have Rico Petro here from Cresco Real Estate if you have any further questions. Commission members. Move approval, Downing. Second. second, Curry. We have a motion second. Further discussion? Roll, please. Bowen. Yes. Downing. Yes. Luker. Yes. Curry. Yes. Paul. Yes. Slight. Yes. Good luck, Rico. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Sure. You, Administrative approvals, please take a look and I'll take a motion when you're ready. Move approval, counting. Second, Fluker. Motion and second, further discussion. Roll, please. Bowen. Yes. Downing. Fluker. Yes. Curry. Yes. Paul. Yes. Slight. Yes. Motion carries. Near West Design Review. This is Barbara Avenue Townhomes, new construction seeking schematic design approval. This is at 3100 Barbara Avenue. Who's here for this? We have Ron You're Sarstad. Welcome. There you go. We can hear you, Ron. Good morning. And who How else? Ever. Well, before you get going, this this was tabled, so um, I would take a motion to take off the table since we have a presenter. I move to take it off the table, Downing. Second. Can go ahead. Okay, motion second. Call the roll, please. Sorry, caught me off guard. Bowen. Yes. Downing. Yes. Booker. August, oh yeah, okay. Curry. Yes. Paul. Yes. Slack. Yes. Okay, it's off the table. Ron, I'm gonna need you to swear in. Um, raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth as you shall answer under the penalty of perjury? I do. And state your name afterwards, please. 
My name is Ron Sarstead. All right, thank you. Go ahead, Ron. Good morning. Uh, let me just start with this project description. It's uh, located on Barber Avenue, about 3,100 blocks, which is approximately six blocks west of West 25th and two blocks north of Interstate 90. The lot size will be a lot will be a combination of three existing lots of record. Uh, size will be 86 by 125 with zone two family. Number of units, there will be four market rate row houses and four affordable rate apartments. Uh, the row houses will be two story, approximately 1600 square feet each. The apartments will be one story above the garages, uh, approximately 720 square feet each. Uh, there will be two parking spots per row house and one parking spot per apartment for a total of 12. Uh, code issues that we will probably run into is that the will require a, a variance for side yard and rear yard on the garage. And we have an issue with access uh, into the garage. We're planning on coming off Joy Court, Coit, Joy, excuse me. Joy Court, which is a dedicated right away, but I don't believe it's paid. So it's an issue that we have to deal with. Sustainability issues, the standard building code or construction issues, but we're also dealing with social inequities, daylighting, energy conservation, urban settings dealing with transportation and food supply, colors to eliminate heat sink. It's an infill development. Uh, we're using Manufacturers that are within a 500 mile radius of Cleveland. Uh, project orientation allows for natural passive design and we'll obviously be dealing with energy conservation. If we go to the next slide, please, page two. The green dot lower center is the site location. Next, uh, next slide, please. The red dot is a project that we're working on right now that has been approved by Near West. It consists of four single family, four uh, affordable rate apartments, same scenario. The green dot is the site that we're talking about today. Next slide, please. And that's kind of a, a, an enlargement of our site. If you take a look at the house or structure on the very top of the page, uh, Joy Court is, runs right down next to it. So with all the trees there, can't tell if it's paved or not, but I was there at the site. Uh, the next couple of slides, excuse me. The next couple of slides will be context of the street. So if we go to the next one, that's it. Uh, on the left, those two. That's where we're going to build. Next slide, please. That's our local pet. She showed up last year. She showed up last year with a broken leg, and the neighborhood took her, literally took her under their wing, and I've been feeding her. Next slide, please. Yeah, time for Thanksgiving. <laughs> you, you know, not in that neighborhood alone. This is this is a proposed row houses taken uh, a view from approximately West 32nd, looking northeast. As you can see, there's four of them. Next slide, please. The site plan. Uh, you see the four row houses, and then the issue of the garage uh, is in the back. It goes from the property line on at a bus joy, and the, the two side yards. So we have to deal with that. With Next slide, please. We have four row houses, basically open plan. Uh, each unit has both a front deck and a floor. Just kicking back and relaxing. 
and a rear deck for de off the dining room for dining. Next slide, please. The, the unit, each unit of the two bedrooms, two and a half baths. Uh, the master, excuse me again, the master bedroom will have its own deck. Next slide, please. If I'm going too fast, say something, okay? Uh, the lighting plan, there's not much to it. It's obviously, it's just a resident, you know, basically a single family resident. Uh, but the front porch of each unit will have three recess uh, cans and two wall sconces on either side of the front door. Uh, and in the rear of the house, there'll be obviously a, uh, a recess can over the stairs, and there'll also be two wall sconces on the deck. Uh, next slide, please. This is the lighting plan for the second floor, and the only lights that we'll be proposing will be wall sconces off the deck uh, on the deck off the master bedroom. Next slide, please. That's what she looks like from the. Next slide, please. And that's what it looks like from the back. We try to keep in context with the uh, architectural character of, of the home in the neighborhood. Next slide, please. Uh, this will be the east side, basically showing the colors. We tried to keep the colors light so that we uh, reflect heat in the, in the summertime. So I'll create a heat sink. Next slide, please. And this would be the other end of the row house. Obviously, the ones in between don't have any windows. Next slide, please. The garage. <clears throat> Each unit will have a two-car garage. Each row house will have a two-car garage. And each apartment will have one-car parking spot. Uh, basically, it's open, uh, except for the garage doors. And we put up a, uh, a screen wall to allow for the storage of the trash bins and to create a, uh, a definition of the walkway to the town row house. Next slide, please. These are the apartments above. Uh, by today's standard, uh, quite generous, it's 720 square feet, and each one of them has its own porch. There's a central stair that gets you from the garage upstairs. Next slide, please. This is the view of the garage from the row houses and the color power. Uh, obviously, where it says open, uh, that will all be covered by the screen wall. On the first floor. On the second floor, that's the, those are the porches. Next slide, please. Uh, these are this is the lighting plan for the garage. It's basically wall sconces on the south face of the garage and on the south face of the screen wall. Um, we haven't really looked at putting lighting on Joy Court uh, because of probably motion, motion activated lights as the car pulls into the garage, uh, garage area, the lights, we'll be putting lights inside there. But we are going to give thought uh, to outside lighting on Joy Court depending on how things work out with the city on paving. Next slide, please. These are some of the details for gutters, uh, the scuppers, and the railing. Next slide, please. This is another view, exterior view of the row houses taken from the opposite direction, up around 30th, looking northwest. Next slide, please. And 
these are a list of materials, suppliers and materials you also have in your profession, uh, color samples, uh, also material samples. Uh, we're going to be using uh, a drive it for stucco and our colors are going, they can customize colors based off Sherwin Williams. Uh, final siding you have there, it's going to be a four inch Dutch lap. And uh, roof shingles you have, and the windows are going to be Pella windows, and you have that sample there also. So the color palettes are all going to be pretty muted and very light to help with energy conservation. If I run too fast, I apologize, but I know you're in a hurry. And uh, I'm open for questions. Okay, Ryan, thank, thank you. you. Commission members. I'm sorry? I'm asking commission members for questions. Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, a question to the applicant. Um, there are five stipulations on Near West design um, review. How are they being addressed? Or are you going to address those? No, we addressed them all already. The drawings that you see now have been modified from what they saw. Primarily the big issues are the windows on the, on the east and west side. Okay. And there's some other stipulations concerning um, exterior lighting, landscaping, 3D uh, model, and also more detailed drawings and colors uh, for, for the entire project and garage. We submitted, you have all that. The garage is the same as the house, the row house. It's identified as still coming down. Well, this is, this says for schematic approval. Well, that's, you know, I would love to have final approval, really, but. But, but you don't have what they've asked for. Yes, I have. Matt Moss will verify it. I didn't see any material samples or colors of anything. I'm sorry. I gave, I gave them I gave them the mat and Matt said he would get them to you. Matt, are you still on the phone? You have paint chips. You have you have uh, vinyl siding cuts. You have uh, the roof. Uh, Information you have the stucco information. This is here. It's, all here. Given, it's, all, it's all given to Matt. Matt, yeah, I can help clarify what the motion was from the local committee. They wanted uh, the 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 bullet points two and three on the motion. They wanted to be explicit to uh, to Mr. Sars said about what they wanted to see. Uh, in return, and when he would, would return for final approval. That's why on the motion form it says provide detailed color and material samples upon return for final approval and landscaping and exterior lighting details. These are requirements we have generally for final approval for all design review cases, but we wanted to be explicit. The committee felt the need to be explicit in, in making the motion specifically for this case. Uh, uh, Mr. Moss, he just asked for final approval. You're I don't think he did. Most applicants ask for final no, approval. No, what, what, no. What I said was, I'm here before. I'm here for schematic approval. If you want to give me final approval, that would be fine with me. <laughs> I mean, I've addressed every issue that Near West brought up. And they're, and they're All right. Drawing. It still has to go to Near West, though. So, what do you guys want to do? I move uh, approval for schematic. Second, Luker. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Further discussion? Call the roll, please. Bowen. Yes. Downing. Yes. Booker. Yes. Curry. Sorry, I, yes. I was on mute. Paul? Yes. Slight. Yes. Motion carries. Good luck. See you soon. Thank um, you, everyone. Have a good day. Stay safe. Thank you. Far West Design Review, uh, Lake Avon multi-family project seeking conceptual approval. This is uh, 9803 and 9805 Lake Avenue. Who's here for this? We have Wesley Harper again. 
Wesley, please raise your right hand and repeat after me. I, well, you don't have to repeat after me. Uh, I solemnly swear to tell the whole truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, as I shall answer under the penalty of perjury. Yes. And state your last your name again. Uh, Wesley Harper with Horton Harper Architects. Okay, go ahead. Thanks. Um, so we, uh, I've been working with real life uh, management on the uh, new development at 9803 and 9805 Lake Avenue. Um, the aerial that you see here, um, obviously, is, is showing our project site highlighted in red. Um, it's currently two parcels. Uh, one of the parcels uh, contains the existing uh, home that you see on the site and a uh, five-car garage in the rear. Uh, the other parcel to the west or to the right here is a piece of vacant property. Uh, uh, and so uh, across Lake Avenue, which uh, is the street that the driveway is coming off of, uh, we have Edgewater Park and Lake Views to the north. Uh, to the south, which would be in the upper portion of the image, that's Clifton, uh, Boulevard, and then further to the right, you'll see West Boulevard uh, as it hits Lake Avenue. Now, the context is a mix of uh, you know, a large scale apartment building to the west, and then uh, kind of a mix of single family and duplexes uh, around us. Uh, at the uh, left, you'll see the church facing Lake Avenue that has recently been developed into, uh, I believe, uh, 10 to 12 townhomes uh, in the past couple of years. Next. Uh, here, right, yes. Um, here at ground level, uh, um, standing in the tree lawn of, of Lake Avenue, you can see the existing home uh, to your left, uh, the vacant site in the middle, and then the existing uh, four-story apartment building to the west. Next. Uh, just another view of the current driveway. Next. Uh, a view back towards the north um, along the side of the house, and then you see the uh, rear of the house to the right. Next. Uh, this is a view from the vacant parcel looking at the existing garage. Next. Uh, here you have the existing large scale apartment building to the west. Um, it, uh, Parking garage, which is uh, below grade in the basement of the building, is accessed from a drive that drops um, uh, down to that level from Lake Avenue. Uh, there's a retaining wall uh, on our property line. Um, and so uh, the developer of the project that we're speaking about uh, and the owner of this parking building have a good relationship. And so um, we will be utilizing this driveway for the development uh, that we'll see. Um, the existing home that's on the eastern property will be rehabbed into uh, two condominiums. Uh, the, the home is basically right now divided into uh, two units. It's a, it's a very large house. Uh, it used to be a bed and breakfast. And uh, this project has been through, um, there's been a lot of uh, versions of this with other develop developers in the past. Uh, they always called for the demolition of that existing house, uh, which has been the main sticking point. Um, from the neighborhood's perspective, the councilman, uh, which is councilman zone, uh, soon to be Jenny Spencer. Um, so we've presented this to, to councilman zone and uh, Ms. Spencer. Um, uh, they responded positively to it and suggested we continue through the process. Uh, next. Uh, again, so so here's the, the, the current layout of the parcels. Uh, the uh, existing home is sitting on a parcel that's 70 by 200. Uh, the vacant parcel is 60 by 200. Um, uh, the parcel is zoned uh, multifamily with a number three height district. And then the existing home is a single family zoning district or zoning uh, designation with a number one height district. So uh, obviously uh, two different uh, and extreme uh, zoning designations. Next. 
what we're proposing uh, from a parcel standpoint is to basically flip the dimensions of the vacant parcel and the existing home. Uh, we would rehab that existing home and the garage itself. Uh, that would be two condominiums. Uh, we're then proposing to build a six-story condominium building uh, aligning with the 40-foot map setback uh, in the front of the vacant parcel and then have four uh, townhomes to the rear. The condos and the townhomes would be accessed off of the existing driveway. Um, uh, and then the new driveway for the the rehabbed house would be switched to the east side of the house. Um, and we would create a pedestrian walk down the middle of that site, uh, leading to the entries of the condominium building and then the town hall. Next. Uh, here is the lower level parking uh, plan. Uh, we're gonna have eight parking spaces uh, within that garage and then uh, if you look closely, you can see that the elevation of the uh, parking uh, slab is uh, at zero, and then the condominium lobby uh, to the to the east is at plus four foot eight. So the parking will be uh, underground. Next, here we have uh, the typical condominium floor plan, which would be roughly two thousand square feet access from an elevator and uh, have a, an egress stair to the to the west uh, and then each unit would have uh, two balconies uh, flanking the north side with lake and park views next here we have uh, an image of the current design which is brick and we're trying to uh, find a happy medium between um, you know, uh, a modern or contemporary building, uh, but respecting the uh, materiality of the uh, adjacent structures. These are, again, uh, preliminary renderings. Once we uh, start to get our approvals, you know, we'd like to Photoshop the existing context in and show the, uh, the true relationship. Um, you can see that we have kind of a five and a half story building, uh, and then the lobby is flanking the building to the east. And that walkway kind of acting as the spine pedestrian access to every unit in this project. Next. You know, we're looking at some different brick uh, options. Next. Next. Um, the balconies would be, uh, you know, obviously at each floor, um, we are uh, pushing the balconies out relative to the front facade on the larger living room balconies and then pushing them in in the more private uh, master bedroom balconies. Um, we, we feel that the art uh, elements here uh, kind of lend itself to a, a more historic interpretation uh, and then add some visual interest to that top level unit. Uh, and their balconies. Next. Just another view. So, you know, we're, we're a little bit taller than the building to the west of us. Um, however, uh, we're maxing out at, at roughly 70 feet, but we have a, a number three height district, which is 115 feet. Uh, so we're well within a, a reasonable uh, height from a zoning perspective. Next. Uh, here's a view showing a little bit more of the lobby and how that's accessed off of the walk. Next. Uh, some elevations. Uh, next. Uh, here you can see the, uh, the lobby and it's cladding. Uh, it would be metal. Uh, brick uh, will be along this eastern facade. Uh, next. And then we get into a more uh, budget-friendly uh, material for the southern and most of the western facade. Next. Next. Uh, the townhomes in the back. This is a view basically from the existing uh, house. Uh, you can see the uh, condominium lobby and how that transitions to uh, townhomes. Again, we're looking to use brick here. Um, we're looking to pro, uh, you know, kind of extend the stairways and the overhangs at the entry um, to define uh, and make that visible from the walks. 
Next. Uh, behind the existing home, we're going to have a little bit of green space, which we think will act as a nice uh, kind of communal space. Uh, this is just showing it as grass, but it could have you know, benches, and, uh, really anything that uh, could be wanted there. Um, but that'll be something we uh, further articulate in uh, the next round of approvals and reviews. Next. Uh, town plans, uh, we don't really need to go over these, but there will be options. Um, they will be two stories uh, facing the uh, green space, and then they will potentially bump up with kind of a, a half floor uh, on the, or excuse me, uh, third level. Next. Um, that's really it, um, unless you want to go through the uh, town home plan and options. Um, we presented to uh, Far West earlier this week. Uh, it was approved for conceptual design, and uh, you know, we're working through Price with Krill Construction and uh, uh, looking to, to continue moving this forward. So, with that, I'd uh, be open to questions. Okay, Commission members, um, what's your pleasure? Uh, uh, go ahead. Move approval, Downing. Second, Stoney, Paul. Okay, we have a motion and a second uh, for conceptual approval. Uh, further discussion? Call the roll, please. Oh, who had something to say? It's, uh, Director Collier, I'm sorry. I uh, didn't pull Go ahead. up in the uh, chat. Uh, no, I just want to uh, just highlight this as being um, very unique. It has a uh, boutique kind of feel to it. I think it's uh, a different uh, type of a style. And uh, I do really appreciate the, uh, the departure from the norm on this. Thank you. I think it'll be a nice project. Thank you, Director. Members? Any other further discussion? Roll, please. Owen. Yes. Downing. Yes. 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 Curry. Yes. Yes. Ball. Yes. Slice. Yes. Motion carries. Good luck, Wesley. Uh, this is a proposed demolition of a two and a half story residential structure seeking final approval. This is, um, who's here for this one? We have Marilyn Masinski. Marilyn, I'm going to have to swear you in. Okay. And it, once you say I do, please state your name. Uh, do you suddenly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth as you shall answer under the penalty of perjury? I do. Marilyn Masinski, Slavic Village Development. Thank you. Go ahead, please. Thanks. I'm here on behalf of the um, the contractor for this, this two-story home. There's this two house parcels on this. The first parcel that I don't think they gave you a picture of um, was uh, on fire. It was a fourth width and came down. Um, this house, you can flip through these as I talk, that's fine. Um, this house was left, has been left vacant and abandoned for years. Um, Right now, this is probably one of the houses that are left on this street. So getting this down will abate a nuisance of folks hanging out in it. There's a church next door that helps some people with food and stuff like that. And they've been afraid getting people to come in because of the people that are hanging out in this house. So having this one come down, it's just part of two houses. One that caught fire and this one was left over um, is to get it approved. It's getting privately demoed. Um, the owner that's taking care of this property that purchased is the gas station that is to um, to the north of it. Um, and they're going to be looking at doing an expansion, possibly adding into a restaurant onto their their property. I move for approval. Second. Motion and second. Further discussion? Call the roll, please. Point. Yes. Downing. Yes. Zucker. Yes. Curry. Yes. Paul. 
Yes. Slight. Yes. Thank you, is Good luck. Thank you. Have a good weekend, everyone. You too. Uh, fire extension, uh, fire station number 26, looking uh, for final approval. This is at 9026 Kinsman. Who's here for this one? Looks like we have Mark Dulick from the city of Cleveland. Is Mark the only one speaking? No. Good morning. Uh, I think Carter was supposed to be here. I'm I'm here, Mark. I just I'll I'll just uh, briefly, <clears throat> excuse me, introduce the um, project and the team. So, this is a new uh, ground up fire station uh, to be located at uh, Kinsman and East 90th. Uh, it'll be a new uh, fire station 26. Uh, we have our uh, design team here, Ann Hartman and Sam Markham from Moody Nolan. Uh, this has been in development with um, in close collaboration with uh, public safety and specifically with the fire department um, to uh, establish, essentially establish as a new standard of um, a, a state-of-the-art facility for fire and EMS that uh, we hope will be, will be our uh, benchmark for any similar projects going forward. We're very excited about this. Um, and with that, I would like to turn over to Mark and Sam to present the material. So, anyone um, that does not work for the city of Cleveland, I'm going to need to swear you in. And uh, when you say I do, please state your name. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, as you shall answer under the penalty of perjury? I do. I think I heard somebody, but it was very faint. I do, Sam Markham. Okay, go ahead. All right, uh, thank you. We're really proud to present this, as uh, Carter mentioned. Um, we also, Keith Larson is also with us um, from the Division of Public Safety, and Steve Skid, who's our project manager, I believe, I uh, was hoping was able to log on as well just to participate. So um, this has been a while in coming, um, and it does replace the uh, uh, existing fire station 26 and also uh, another fire station um, on MLK. So this is really combining two uh, stations into one. Um, but it was uh, the site was chosen, and we're very fortunate to have it at the corner of uh, Kinsman and East 90th um, because it, it was uh, it met the criteria of the Deccan program that the Cleveland Division of Fire used to locate fire stations to um, uh, meet or improve uh, service times from the station for both uh, fire. And of course, this also does involve the uh, division of a EMS as well. So with that, I will turn it over to Sam, um, and then anybody on our team can answer questions as they come up. Take it away, Sam. Hi, can you hear me, or is my, is my microphone working better now? Yes, yeah, we can hear, hear you. you. Okay, good. Okay, so as Mark said, uh, I'm Sam Mark. Moving on, in respect to everybody's time, I will try to go through this uh, relatively quickly. Um, we we did present to uh, a design review a couple weeks ago, and we'll we have addressed their comments. I did send Nicole an updated elevation. Uh, Nicole, was that updated elevation put into this um, presentation? I don't believe so. Okay. Well, we'll get when we get to it. I'll describe it, and when and uh, it's a pretty simple modification. So go to, go ahead to the next slide, please. So the uh, uh, red spot in the middle is the project's new location. We're on Kinsman Road in East East Ninetieth, uh, uh, very close to the East Ninety Third uh, North South intersection. You can see highlighted on the um, uh, location plan the existing fire station twenty six uh, northwest of us on Kinsman Road, and the existing fire station forty one. East of us, that's located on East 116th. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is some of the context in the area. Um, you'll see uh, a lot of these um, highlighted uh, parcels are shown on the next slide. So we'll look at them individually. Our next series of slides, go ahead. The project site as it is currently today, uh, as of uh, this photo is from November of last year. Uh, large empty site. There's a lot of vacant land around this uh, parcel. You can see the immediate properties to the east, west, and just northwest of us. Um, the property immediately north uh, appeared vacant, but it's no longer vacant. Go ahead to that next slide. 
it, it is now a Dollar General uh, in that area, a newer McDonald's store, an existing gas station. Southeast of us, there's a uh, party, party center and liquor store. Uh, next slide, please. Um, some of the other uh, uh, built up buildings around our site, the church just southwest of us, that would be the new neighbor and uh, some of the other developments going up East 93rd. Go ahead, next slide. There is some uh, multifamily, single family, family residential in the area as well, uh, immediately to our south and also along uh, 93rd and even more single family um, east of East 93rd. Go ahead. And lastly, this is some of the uh, two of the projects uh, more recently developed, the CMHA headquarters uh, west of us on Kinsman and just across the street from that, the, the, um, the uh, architecture office. Architecture. Um, Box stop, um, and then the police precinct is just to the east, uh, adjoining the public green space. Next slide. Okay, so we're the fire station and fire department are hoping that this project can spur some development. Uh, they're going through a lot consolidation process right now. We're uh, that's that's in process. So this is the overall site plan. We've set the building back um, 60 feet from the uh, new sidewalk. Oh, and I should mention that Kinsman Road in this section is currently going through a uh, widening through ODOT, and we are actively coordinating with ODOT. So they're going to construct some of these proposed curb cuts and do some of the utility pole relocations. Um, you know, we are actively working with them as part of this process. We did rely some on their uh, traffic study, uh, and um, the only notable outcome of that, for your purposes, is that we do not need traffic signaling in this uh, location. That is something that the fire department uh, generally doesn't require unless it's, uh, you know, it's preferred not to have it unless they really need it. And with the large front apron, um, that works as a much better uh, tool for the fire department to uh, manage their emergency egress onto Kinsman Road. So the uh, it's kind of one way traffic for the fire trucks and ambulances. They would, Upon returning, they would come down East 90th, turn into the part uh, large apron, clean off the truck, fill it up, and pull it into the apparatus bay. And then they can egress directly onto Kinsman Road. The parking lot to the south is uh, enclosed, fenced in for the firefighters. Um, we are uh, combining lots that are technically um, some of those are residential lots on the southwest where that new parking lot is. So we have a privacy fence uh, along the south and east borders of the site. That was for our zoning review. Um, if you go to the next slide, it's a little bit more. I'm sorry, this is the site lighting plan. Go to the next one. This is the this is the landscape plan. So on the east section, east part of the plan, working away from east to west, we have a community center with a community parking lot, a large open front lawn for meet your police, meet your fire events. There are two small plaza spaces, one in north of the community center, that's on the uh, the right, the east end of the building. And then on the west section would be the front plaza for the entrance to the firehouse. We have a flagpole, a bench, all the things you associate with a fire station. But uh, importantly, we've retained the large front yard for open gatherings. They want this to be where the, where the community comes to be with the firefighters and, and see the firehouse. Um, it is important, though, to remember that the firefighters that live here 24 seven and they need a private space. So we've mm -hmm. built them a private backyard uh, to the on the west on East 90th. That is a retaining wall that holds the earth up about four feet and I'm sorry, about three feet. And then there's a four foot tall privacy fence, uh, giving them about a seven foot, uh, seven foot tall uh, screening from the street. So they can see over, but the uh, walking along the street would be pretty difficult to see into their uh, into their backyard. Um, we have given vegetative screening and fence screening from the parking from the residences, as I mentioned on the, mentioned on the last slide. Go ahead to the next. So, just so we can talk about the parts of the building on the right side, the light blue is the community room. That would be more open to the public. The red is the apparatus bay where the trucks and ambulance sit uh, and are parked permanently and on display. We have large open glass on the north. Uh, you'll see that in a later rendering. Um, in the yellow is the decon. So it's very important for the firefighters as they come back from a fire station 
to be able to uh, clean off uh, their clothes and bodies become contaminated with um, uh, uh, cancer causing contaminants, chemicals. It's, it's just very bad. So we need to, um, we've actually isolated that decontamination zone for them to clean their gear, clean their bodies and get back into the, the green area where they live. So there should be no cross contamination between the red and the green. And then in the south, uh, you can see the sleeping quarters, the sleeping bunks in the lighter green section. Um, go ahead to the next slide. So these are the existing fire stations. Fire station 26 is on the top. That's the one west on Kinsman. Fire station 41 is uh, to the east on East 116th. We've taken, uh, we, we're not taking the actual brick from those buildings, but we've found bricks that approximately match those buildings. And some equipment and furnishings from inside those stations is also coming with us. Um, notably, they're they're really into their um, dining room tables, so we're using those. And uh, the light fixture you see in the bottom left is a custom fabricated piece that they want to take over. So we are trying to preserve some of the culture and history of both of these fire stations as we integrate them into a new building. Next slide. We took the brick, created a pallet, um, the building, you know, everybody thinks of brick when you have a fire station. Um, we are kind of prominently displaying that brick on the north elevation, but uh, a majority of the building is, or at least close to half the building is, uh, is also wrapped in metal panels. So these are the sort of uh, material pallets that we're using. Um, the privacy fence and the perimeter fence there in the, in the top is uh, uh, aluminum. Um, and the, the parking lot fence is really so, that's along the north edge of the uh, private parking lot, just so they can see into their parking lot. Um, that's a security concern. Go ahead to the next slide. This is a close up partial rendering showing our application of the materials. Um, the, the brick coursing in this rendering is, a, is a, leaves a little bit to be desired. There's a, there's a patterning that you can see that wouldn't really be there. It's a common bond coursing that we're going to be using. Uh, split face CMU water table, uh, aluminum siding, two different types of metal panel, and uh, uh, typical storefront system, typical city of Cleveland projects. Next slide. So this is the overall uh, elevation, and the uh, the top one did get did get uh, updated because there used to be only a two wide panel on the the community center is to the left in uh, on the top elevation. <laughs> At the previous presentation, that was only two window panels wide. We've wind it to three as uh, one of their recommendations. So working your way left to right, you have the community center, the uh, hose tower where they dry the uh, where they hang the hoses to dry, the apparatus bay, and the um, uh, the apparatus bay is in the darker red, darker brick, and the firehouse is the beige brick. So we've got these. Two masses we've been calling the mass A apparatus bay, mass B, the firehouse connected by this band of metal panel. Uh, that's the massing diagram. And then on the lower portion of the sheet is the west elevation looking from East 90th Street. You see the retaining wall, the fence, and then a uh, third mass, the sleeping bunks wrapped in a darker metal panel, engaging with that um, horizontal silver band. Next slide. Um, these are the south elevation on the bottom and the east elevation on top. These would be minimally seen from uh, by the public, uh, particularly if the east elevation would be seen more. Uh, if this spurs any further development, that would be that land would become occupied. So these would be the less seen elevations. Um, next slide. So this is the rendering from. Kinsman Avenue showing sort of what it would look like as they pull the truck out. We've got those large glass openings in the front to display the, the trucks. Uh, that's going to be illuminated uh, like a big glowing lantern uh, in the evening to, to display the trucks at nighttime. Uh, and the tower would have that same effect as well. Next slide. This is sort of standing on the sidewalk. This is the older rendering where we only had a two wide uh, window at the community room, you can see that has been wind to a three wide window at the request of the design review. Um, the other request from design review that was addressed in. Can you go back to that slide. Sorry, uh, this is the new slide that uh, Nicole just sent. This is the new elevation with the three wide panels at the community, uh, the three wide window at the community room. But if you can go back to the rendered. 
Okay. There we go. So this this still shows the older configuration. We did not re-render that that perspective view, but that window has been increased in size. The other comment that came from uh, design review was the illumination of the tower. Um, we're we're showing in our current plan we have a lot of uplighting inside the tower to make that tower glow at nighttime. The request was to illuminate the tower from the exterior, and we are investigating doing that. The the short answer is um, uplighting exterior components has some lead limitations. We are pursuing lead credit for this project, and we really need every lead point we can get. We're going to try to get uplighting on that tower. Um, so as long as we can do it within the limits of what lead prescribes. Uh, but if we can't do that, we're going to rely on the uh, glowing and uplighting of the tower from the inside. Next sheet. So this is a uh, sort of a dusk evening rendering showing the lighting that we do have. Uh, this is the closer to the East 90th Street. So you're standing in the northwest section of the site looking at the main entrance to the firehouse. The uh, flagpole and pub small public plaza waiting area in the uh, in front of the firehouse section. Next slide. And this would be the view uh, sort of of the, the firehouse, the backyard from standing on East 90th Street. You can see the retaining wall and the four foot tall fence on top of the retaining wall. Next slide. That's the end. So, any questions? Great. Commission members, questions? Um, I have a quick question. It's kind of, it's related but unrelated. Um, does this project trigger the percent for art since it's a capital project? And any thoughts about where that would go? Um, this is Mark Dulek. Um, it does, in fact, uh, trigger the public art component. Um, at this point, we would anticipate it being somewhere within the um, exterior space of the of the site, perhaps towards the front corner. Okay. Is Tar Tar is Tara been involved in that? And the only reason I say is that um, for me, I think it's a kind of important court corner and a kind of an interesting opportunity, but. Also, since the, there's flexibility with that ordinance, that it also can be placed elsewhere within this geography that might make sense. And and since this is a civic project, there could be something related to that. Anyway, I know you're thinking about it, but um, I just, in this case, think because of the, not a lot of city facilities are this visible always. And so this one is, and it might be a really important opportunity to start thinking about now in terms of it being more integrated into thinking. Mr. Chairman, we do have Tara online too. She'd like to speak. Tara, go ahead. I was just going to say thanks, Lillian, for asking that question. I actually had just sent Mark an email about um, a public art component. I thought this uh, project would trigger that, so I just wanted to say thanks for asking that question. I'm on it. To, this yeah, is August. Your email. To August, <laughs> to Lillian's point, it, um, it always seems like public art becomes the afterthought, and and then it, you know let's place it because it's convenient and not part of the the the, the pro process, and and so it's more intentional, so it means more. So you know, I just wanted to piggyback on Lillian. Thank you. August, this is Carter. Um, yeah, we do want to be uh, intentional about that, and, and we are trying to be more um, proactive during design um, with uh, with all of our major capital projects, and, and uh, we're, we're talking with Tara pretty regularly. The um, Unfortunately, because the 1.5% is defined by the actual construction costs, we're not able to really start the formal uh, engagement process with artists until we have construction bids. I mean, ideally, in an, you know, an ideal world, we'd be working with an artist now, um, but at least we want to start um, having that conversation uh, with Tara about where the opportunities are. And, and certainly, it, it's an excellent point that this is such a prominent site um, that there are um, unusual opportunities here that we want to capitalize on. Thanks, Carter. And um, so this is a one, just a design comment, and it's not a requirement. It's just a personal preference. Um, I don't necessarily love the white material. 
in relationship to this design that she really liked the design. I love that it's going to be a beacon and the kind of mix it for me. It's just the, 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 the choice of a white with this mix of colors to me. I just don't love it, but I love the design. So take it for whatever it's worth. Thanks. Lally. I like the beacon and if done right, you, I think you'd really be able to see that from a distance. If it's at the top of the hill. So does someone want to make a motion? I was going to comment that it's actually a, uh, the, the white colored uh, metal is actually a clear anodized, not white color. So it's anodized in sort of a graphite gray. Wait, the white is actually an anodized gray? Clear anodized uh, aluminum panel. Yeah. Oh, then what's the gray? Well, more like a, more like a it's a it's actually a painted finish that that looks. Like a clear anodize, it's the basis of design is silversmith from Centria. Um, it, for all intents and purposes, it's got like a metallic mica coating in it. Uh -huh. um, the, the darker gray is a profiled um, uh, inch, uh, one inch profiled uh, horizontal panel that has um, has a, like a, a relief pattern. You can you can kind of see it in the rendering here above that door, but um, it's not very stark. But that's more of a graphite color. Okay. Well, that's better. I just prefer would prefer the silver color than than the white. But okay, that's good. Uh, I move approval. Uh, second August. Question second. Further discussion. Roll please. Yes. Raised. Uh, Bowen. Yes. Downing. Diane. She had to leave at ten. She had to leave. Okay. 11, sir. Luker. Yes. Curry. Yes. Paul. Yes. Yes. Do we ask for slides? I did. I think he did respond. Yes. Yeah, I didn't, yeah, I didn't hear that. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Good. Thanks. Okay. Motion carries. Good luck. Uh, Northeast Welcome. Design Review Thank Special you. Pre Huh? You're welcome. Uh, mm -hmm. Special Presentation Churchill Gateway Mid Block Connector. Who's here for this? We have Michael McBride. Of the yeah, I'm here. Start my video, but it doesn't want to work. But. I'm Michael McBride from the Department of Community Development, Housing Development Office. Thank you, Mike. And since you're part of staff, I don't have to swear you in. Great, thanks. Um, Mr. Chairman and the board, th thanks for having me on here. This is a, a presentation related to the next presentation for Churchill Gateway and the uh, documents that I submitted didn't did not include the like the site plan and the aerial view that's in the next presentation. I'm wondering if it would be appropriate to be able to refer to those now uh, in advance of that presentation, even though it wasn't my submittal. So just to give it some context. Um, Maurice, is that something you can do? I'm doing it right now. All right. Just tell me where you want me to be. Um, there's an aerial. I think. There you go. Right. Let me actually look at it on my computer. I think there's a. Uh, well, I don't know exactly what was submitted there, but I have an aerial that has the site outline. That's probably the best. Uh, That's what I have on screen. Okay, great. So um, the background is this: this uh, project, Churchill Gateway, is is proposed for the Harry Davis school site, which is today owned by CMSD, is in the process of being transferred to the city, and the city's working with uh, uh, internally with a team to uh, prepare the site for development. One, the first phase of that development is going to be uh, done by the NRP group that's coming up next for Churchill Gateway, and we're also um, and so we're working hard to also create a, uh, a site that has future development potential for some mixed 
income, probably mixed use development that meets the uh, mayor, the goals of the mayor's neighborhood transformation initiative. I should mention that's this, this site is in that area. Um, what I wanted to talk about uh, today was just some related to the conditions for approval that were mentioned in the last uh, CPC meeting uh, for a mid block connection. And also to talk about um, some uh, recommendations for meeting the uh, uh, requirements of the of a local design review commission for traffic calming on the site. Maurice, I think there's a closer up version of this that sort of shows the, the development site. Maybe it's the next slide. No, nope, that's further away. Hold on. Uh, it's uh, well, you know, you can actually if you go back one, I'll just I'll I'll. Uh, here's closer. These are site looks like yeah. site photos. Um. So the well, let me just say the background then the um. Committee development, planning, building and housing demolition, MOCAP, executive uh, uh, economic development in the mayor's office at, at, as part of MNTI are all working together to bring this, uh, to, to come up with a plan to demolish this school, uh, abate the environmental hazards on the site and clear all the uh, requirements for spending federal money to do that and then prepare a site for development by NRP group. Um, what I'm talking about here today, and this is all happening, that's a lot of work. There's a lot of moving pieces um, in order to get this. That's a good right there is that was the, actually the slide I was looking for. Thank you, Maurice. Um, so we're working together to prepare this for construction as soon as uh, late spring, summer, um, with a lot of different financing coming together. And um, as part of that, um, one of the agenda items that we have to do is figure out the legal descriptions for what parcel we're going to transfer, the city will transfer to the developer and how to do that. And so that's really the, the reason why I'm here today as part of that discussion. We've committed in our, in our meetings with the developer to figure that out in the month of November, which has a little bit of time left in it. Um, and so uh, what we're talking about is, is recommendations for a mid block connection that is has public access and 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 what we are proposing is that the um oh and also for a, a the sort of design of that connection that um addresses the requirement and goal of, of sort of a safe pedestrian connection for the public through the site um and i think there was a well i'm sure there was a a, a condition on the schematic approval by CPC to study and address that issue. Um, so separate from the, the kind of working group that's getting the site ready and demolishing the school, we pulled together a group to talk about how, how that could happen. And that group included community development, um, Kelly Mersman from the planning department, who specializes in bike and pedestrian connections, Shannon Leonard, who uh, specializes in, in zoning, we brought in um, uh, professional engineer Eva Vargas from engineering and construction to make sure that the, uh, or to sort of understand what the requirements for a city dedicated right of way would be in case that was the direction we're gonna go. We also submitted this to uh, the streets department for review. So what our proposal is that the, um, the the two parcels be created, one for the development and one for the connection. Um, the parcel for the connection would be designed to meet the requirements for a dedicated city street without having to be a city street. Um, we have that flexibility. And um, I'm gonna just stop and, and talk about the site plan that we're looking here. So there, the, the planning commission called that, this out and it makes, so much good sense to have a permanent public access between Orville and Churchill here. You can see that that the south side of Churchill is the longest block by far in the in this part of Glenville. It's uh, it's 1,669 feet long according to a study, which is probably almost three times of a best practices block length, and um, and it really serves as a barrier to uh, to getting through this neighborhood for um, 
cars now and potentially for people on foot if this entire block is privatized. So you can see at the north side of the site, right where it says Churchill to the left, there's a little kaboom park there. And you can see the little pathways where the kids come through. If you actually look on Google Street View, you'll see kids walking on these pathways. Then if you look down to the south, Orville and below, right now, if you live on in that area of the neighborhood and you want to get to that little park to play with your friends, you can walk through the small site that's, that's open and it has access. What we want to, what we want to ensure is that, that that access, that connection between the site remains sort of a permanent feature and doesn't become a barrier to, uh, to the neighborhood generally. So our plan is to um, propose that the site be, that this, uh, that a 60 foot wide parcel sort of be created in the vicinity of that short part of that L site on, this, on the map. We can work out the details as far as ownership and uh, whether that be owned privately by the developer or by the city. Um, you know, we're not gonna figure that out in the next week, um, but we can figure it out. Um, and then we'll also, um, we wanna propose that the, the driveway that, that gets built on that parcel is built to meet city standards so that in the event that uh, it were to be dedicated as a city street it would it would have the right horizontal dimensions I'm not saying that it has to be built right now to the city's sort of street requirements which might require a more expensive uh, curbs and and stormwater but at least it would at least it would fit in space as a city street and it wouldn't be any bigger or or smaller than this than the proposal that we have, which is a 60 foot wide uh, parcel. And then inside that 60 foot wide parcel, and here, Maurice, maybe, can you switch to that street mix view? The which view? This is, this is the, this would be the, I'm sorry for the kind of disjointed nature of this. This would be the what I submitted. No, there's a different file that, that I put in for this that I'm um, not kind of realizing how the order was gonna go. But it's not, this is RDL submittal and, and, or NRP. So, yeah, there you go. So, this would be the dimension of, a, of, a, of the cut through here that we've done some research to determine that it meets or exceeds all city minimums for lane widths. Um, it's got a five foot uh, tree line on each side, which meets the city's requirement for planting street trees, a five foot sidewalk on each side. And then there's two feet outside, out, out board of the sidewalk on either end. So uh, there's a little bit of a buffer there. And I guess someday, 100 years from now, when that street's, that tree's so big that it heaves up the sidewalk, we can just move the sidewalk over two feet instead of cutting the tree down. Um, so we're proposing these as the dimensions of the, of the uh, driveway to go through, and that the 60 foot width be the, uh, the size of the parcel. We also looked into zoning uh, to make sure that, that the sort of two lot solution didn't create a zoning problem, and it doesn't. It actually, um, we found that it might actually um, solve some zoning issues and make it easier because uh, the uh, north and the Churchill end of the site has a has a uh, more restrictive zoning that um, we can. You know, won't be uh, the, the school won't be held to that. I'm mean, not the school. The, uh, the apartment development won't be held to that. So, I guess that's. I think that's the end. I have to say. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, we have we have Mr. Fluker and Mr. Oh, sorry, Miss Watley. Uh, yes. Yeah. I've never. What I'm going to strongly advise and act and advocate for is that um, you include the community in the design of this street because it always happens in black and brown communities that you design for and not with. It sounds like you pretty much decided what this is going to be, but there's no communication with the city or at least the CDC or, or, or youth who might be using this street. And I think it needs to, to be more um, intentional and more respectful in that regard. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. And we have Ms. Watley. Hi, good morning, everybody. Sharonda Watley, City Planning. Thank you for that. 
Um, but I think it's important that we reflect the commission on the content um, and also the proposal that we have before us. Um, uh, NRP and RDO have started to address um, some of the motion from the last time that, that they were at the planning commission. Um, and so they also have um, a very similar street connector. Um, so I do think um, that um, it'll be better for the commission to kind of see the proposal before them so that they can make a, a good determination. Um, both proposals are very similar. Um, there's just a minor differences in the aim width and the overall price. Thank you. Um, I was just going to say, it's brilliant. I just want to thank the city and uh, for um, hearing us about this um, mid-block crossing and working on it because um, I think it's a much better sort of layout now for the block and even for future potential development of the rest of the block. So um, I know I, I hear August and I think more work on the design is, but I think this 60 foot right away and its location is much better than what we saw before. So I just want to thank the city for actually following through on this. Thank you. Uh, hey, Director, as far as um, this is a special presentation, but there's uh, action at the bottom. Are we taking action on this or is this just presentation information only? So the uh, actual uh, Churchill Gateway apartment uh, piece is really what we're focusing on. This is uh, basically added to that uh, previous discussion. Um, so the actual proposal for the, uh, the Churchill Gateway uh, apartments is what, what needs approval. Okay, so this doesn't need uh, action separately. Uh, this is to inform us of the apartment and when we review that next. Correct. Okay, thank you. Other commission members, questions, comments? Or should we move on to the presentation of the apartments? We go hand in hand. Okay, let, let's move on. So um, the development team and the design team, I need you to raise your right hand. Uh, do you soundly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth as you shall answer under the penalty of perjury? Yes, I do. Can you state your name once you say yes? Uh, Scott Skinner. Darren Pakoda, yes. And your sermon is yes. Okay. All right, go ahead, please. Great. Um, so, you know, once again, uh, thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate this process. Uh, since we last spoke, we've had a, a, a couple, couple additional community meetings, and we've incorporated their feedback as well as what we heard from you all when we were here last month. Um, I'm going to talk about the project here at a high level for just a few minutes before I hand things off to Ron and Andrew to talk about the uh, the specific architectural and, and landscape elements of the project. I will try to power through this quickly since I know it's been a long morning for everyone and I know um, we've already now seen most of this presentation. Um, so just as a refresher um, from the last time we are here, Churchill Gateway is a 52 unit mixed use apartment project. It's funded by the Ohio Housing Finance Agency uh, through the Low Income Housing Tax Credit Program. It sits between Churchill and Orville Avenue, just a few feet from East 105th in the Glenville neighborhood. And just for, for context, um, this is an affordable housing project, uh, and the units are, are affordable here to, uh, to folks between 30 and 60% of the area median income, something that the neighborhood actually told us they were really enthusiastic about in community meetings. And can you go up, back a few slides really quick, please? Sure, what would you like to see? Uh, back one more. Perfect. Uh, so this is a, a zoomed out version of the same map just to highlight the site's proximity to University Circle and University Hospitals. Um, I am highlighting this map specifically because we're, we're partnering with University Hospitals on this project. They'll be occupying roughly 3,000 square feet of commercial space on the first floor in the southwest portion of our building. And they're going to use the space for community programming targeted. Uh, right now, the idea is that that programming will be targeted at uh, pregnant women and young mothers, uh, families, and then a space for senior gathering. Uh, this is all based off of a, a number of community meetings that we've done with UH uh, and, and, the, and the neighborhood over the last few months. So next slide, please. 
switching gears a little bit, here are some photos of the existing conditions of the site. Um, I think Mike just mentioned this, but it's formerly the Harry E. Davis School, which was built in the 1960s. Uh, the site's been vacant since 2012. Um, and I, I've been inside a few times. The interior is in pretty rough shape with the asbestos flooding and, and vandalism over time. So we're, we're working with community development. Uh, we're on a bi-weekly call with them, um, and we're working with CMSD to coordinate uh, the demolition of the school before we do new construction. And, and now you can go to the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so this is an image um, that you've already seen of our building overlaid onto the existing site. Uh, so this project will be one four-story building right along Orville uh, with parking tucked here in the back. Uh, like I mentioned, there will be 52 units, uh, eight one-bedroom units, 24 two-bedroom units, and 23 bedroom units. There's gonna be porches lining the street uh, on uh, along Oroville that we think creates a nice uh, transition from the commercial 105th uh, into the single family neighborhood here. Um, and just for context, this site is, is, is about five acres. Uh, we're laying out our building in a way to create space for additional phases of development. And we're working with, as Mike mentioned, working with the city and with Famicos to identify you know, exactly what that's going to look like. There's no firm plans as of now. Uh, what we do know is that for now, the city is gonna re retain ownership of this additional land, everything not highlighted here. Uh, and we're working with them as well as relaying the feedback that we've heard um, in, in from neighborhood meetings to ensure that this extra space be dealt with uh, thoughtfully in the interim between, uh, between phases of development, because we don't know what that length of time is going to be. And then, to, to get into the conversation we were just having, I also want to highlight this throughway here, um, which we were asked to take a look at last time we were planning. Um, we were asked to, to, to make this more pedestrian friendly to encourage neighbors to walk through if needed. So we, we've included six foot sidewalks as, as well as some additional trees. Uh, we've also changed these parking spaces to be parallel parking, which I think helped make this feel more like a street and, and, and less like a parking lot. And like Mike mentioned before us, our, our intention for this is to be a, a private and privately maintained road with a permanent easement granted to the city and to any other project being developed here to ensure that the community has access. Um, you know, like I mentioned, we've been working with community development on, on the specific details of this, but we think that this is the, the simplest and, and really the most cost effective solution um, for, for an affordable housing project. The current plan that you're seeing here is a result of collaboration with, uh, with community development staff, with community members, and yeah, I've, I've done three community meetings myself in the last two months, and we have one more planned, and we've been working with Famicos as well. Uh, we started this entire process with just our piece, uh, where, where the building's laid out uh, and, and no connector and have grown it to uh, in, include a connection that, that had parking spaces, um, a ver uh, horizontal parking spaces last time we were here, uh, it, that now has parallel parking spaces based off of this body's feedback. And you know, we're, we're happy to talk about the differences in our plan. They're, they're to Sharonda's point, uh, very, very subtle uh, compared to what Mike had presented, but you know, we, we've been on city calls with uh, the community development and, and all the other players in this pretty regularly. Um, I, I th and, and what we have planned is, is pretty similar to what Mike presented just a few minutes ago. I think our driveway is a little bit wider, but uh, we, we don't necessarily have an issue with it being slightly more narrow. And, and, and we had seen the, the images that, that Mike had presented, he sent them to us Wednesday night. Um, but I mean, generally with, with this plan that, that, that you see in front of you here, we really do think that this will look, feel and operate like the, the pedestrian friendly mid block connection that, that we think you all were looking for. Um, and happy to go into more detail uh, on, on that in just a few minutes. You go to the next slide, please. So this is an outline of what future phases uh, of development could potentially look like. Like I mentioned, the rest of the site will continue to be owned by the city of Cleveland. So there's no firm plan for additional phases right now, but this is just to show you that the, the, the way we've laid out our site and, and the mid block connector here is conducive to additional phases of development. Um, and you can go to the next slide, and I'm going to hand things off to uh, to Ron to dive into the design, into RDL's design. You're muted, Ron. Thank you, Scott. Can you guys hear me now? Yep. Yes. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, I think that this gives you a site plan on a more technical level that gives you a, a general understanding of the way that the uh, building is oriented um, down on Orville Avenue. Uh, if you look to your left, um, not far off the page would be 105th, and there's a big lot there as well. Um, so I think that what you have is is that elevation at the bottom of the page, 
and the left elevation that has um, the prominence that uh, we want to really look at. Um, overall, uh, the building also has a, uh, a playground associated to it and, and some landscape items that um, Andrew Steinglass will get um, described after me. But if we go to the next slide. Um, this is the overall plan. Um, what you see at the bottom of the page is four townhomes. Those townhomes are facing Orville Avenue. Um, we've organized them and oriented them in, in order to create um, more action along Orville, um, create a, a better relationship to the community um, so that there are stoops, entrances, and, and um, that it's more inviting uh, along Orville on that side. And then um, on the left side of the upper pages is where you see um, the University Hospital's uh, Opportunity Center. That's the 3,000 square feet that's um, sort of ending, bookending the building um, facing 105th and um, essentially organizing the building in a way that creates that prominence along that side and that visibility along that side. If we go to the next slide. Um, these are the technical elevations. I think it, it does better justice to look at the color elevations um, for the Planning Commission first if we maybe flip it. Flip Mr. Over Mr. Chair, to the applicant, we've we've seen this before. Could you hit the highlights? Because we'll lose another member yeah. soon. Thanks. Sorry. Right. Uh, so the updates that have happened is that we've increased the roof line pitches um, from 612 to 812 based on the DRC request. Um, we've added glazing along that west elevation facing 105th. So we've doubled the glazing at the ground floor and changed the material to be fire cement siding um, for the university hospitals. Um, so that was really the, the main crux of the updates that occurred uh, along the project in order to address uh, the DRC's concerns and the planning commission's comments. Um, there were minor adjustments. There weren't any major um, planning commission or DRC comments. And uh, I think maybe Andrew, maybe I hand over to Andrew Steingast and the, for time. August Fluker has another uh, comment. Yeah, um, on the on the throughway that that's been talked about here for the last few minutes. How, if I'm a resident, how would I know that that's not a private drive and I can actually utilize it? What's going to be distinguished? Sure. How is it going to be distinguished from the parking lot and not your, not private property? Sure. So when, when you go through the drive, it's a, it's another separate turn into the parking lot. We can we're, we're happy to put some sort of uh, signage there, some sort of indicator that that's where the private lot starts. But you know, as you're walking through the neighborhood, there are sidewalks that will go through that will look and feel like like normal sidewalks and will be connected to the sidewalks that already exist on Orville and Churchill uh, as a connector through. So I I I don't know that it will be distinguishable, uh, the, the difference will be distinguishable to residents. So, so the curb cut will feel like a regular curb cut to a street. Exactly. Okay. All right. Mr. Chairman? Yes. Yeah, if I, I can make a, a, a comment uh, with respect to uh, the terminology throughway. Uh, when you say throughway, it, 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 uh, it makes it feel like the idea is to uh, ensure that cars have a cut through to the other side of the street, which is not the intent. Right, so I think when we should rephrase uh, greenway. Uh, second, uh, with respect to how the ground plane is treated, um, we should give some consideration to treating the ground plane a little bit different, whether it's some type of pavement treatment or something that distinguishes it and makes it feel uh, more uh, inviting and not just, uh, you know, paid like the rest of the, uh, uh, the street. So just treating that ground plan differently to give it some type of distinctive, char distinctive characteristic uh, so that people who feel like it's a uh, uh, multiple use type of uh, connection, you know, versus uh, feeling like some type of Thank you, Freddie. Thank you. Sir, do you want to continue? Sure. No, no. Andrew, do you want to take it from here? Uh, sure, go to the next slide, please. This shows the landscape plan for this project. Uh, there are very 
for the most part, I won't go through what we talked about last time. The one major update we have made to this is we have added some native grass screening to the north side of the parking lot. And this was something that came out of uh, DRC's suggestion. This screening will allow there to will break up the parking lot views from Churchill Avenue. However, it will not be so overwhelming that programming can still happen between this new building and the lots before future development happens. Uh, one of the other updates that we have made is we have added some additional trees to the site, particularly along this drive. Uh, next slide. Uh, this just show the fence, fencing detail, which we have already uh, seen in the last presentation. So next slide. And then this just shows some furnishings as a reminder that we'll be using on this project. These were also in the last presentation. Next slide. And at this point, I'm turn it back over to Scott to wrap up the presentation. Absolutely. So this is the this is the previous um, plan that we had uh, at the last time we were in front of this body. Um, so you can see the the additional trees that were added, as well as the change in the in the actual parking. Um, and then if you can go two more slides, please, that's the final one. And we I'm happy to just sort of hold that up there as we uh, as we answer questions and discuss. So one more after this, please. Thank you so much. Um, and, and, and again, everyone really appreciate the time um, and, and, and the feedback here. So I'm happy to answer any questions. Commission members. I move approval. I second, Paul. Okay, we have a motion to second. Further discussion? Just, Mr. Chair, just a quick point of discussion. Uh, just so we're all uh, make kind of a point of information. The design review district, the comment of additional landscaping and trees within the tree lawn, just want to point out to everyone that that's actually the purview of urban forestry and public works, and I, I hate for us to be holding uh, developers and others to things that are sort of out of their control. I think it's also another... Uh, justification for the tree commission, which I know has been uh, before this body before. So I just wanted to put that out there so that we're not setting uh, false expectations at the local level um, about the uh, the purview of the site. Thank you, Councilman. Yeah, and Any further add, discussion? Yes, and if I can add to that, uh, there uh, is the tree preservation uh, ordinance uh, that is out. The things that are uh, going to be required of development, and I'm going to uh, speak to this as a director's report, um, is for projects over one acre or uh, where you have under acre with a unit of buildings. Um, a tree preservation would need to be shared with urban forestry. Um, and as I look at your uh, proposal, uh, obviously you're adding to this particular site. So, and I'll talk to you offline um, with respect to that, uh, but it shouldn't be an issue for you um, given what you propose. But it is a matter of process of uh, how uh, that a tree preservation uh, plan will need to be submitted with your uh, permit application. So, again, this is newer. Um, and again, this is just starting to be administered. So, I'll inform you of the details of that. Okay. Thank you, Director. Thank you. Thank you, Director. Um, anyone else? Roll, please. Bowen. Yes. Fluker. Yes. Curry. Yes. Paul. Yes. Light. Yes. Congratulations. Good luck. Thank uh, you very much, everybody. Really appreciate it. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. So we have two more uh, quick agenda items. We have Matthew from LDA Near West Design Review new member nomination. Uh, you guys should have received his resume. Um, I would take a motion. So moved. So resident number seventeen. Second. Motion is second. Further discussion. Call the roll, please. Bowen. Yes. Fluker. Yes. Curry. Yes. Ball. Yes. Slife. Yes. Okay. And then we have Maggie uh, Dimmit Architects.
Move approval. Second. Motion second. Is there discussion? Call the roll, please. Bowen. Yes. Fluker. Yes. Curry. Yes. Ball. Yes. Slife. Yes. Great. We have finished and I'm adjourning the meeting and we've done it before noon. Thanks to everybody for their speedy comments. Thanks. Happy holiday, everyone. Uh, do we have a director's report? Real quick, I'm just going to uh, make a request that at our next meeting, the presentation of the tree ordinance uh, be presented to the commission. Okay, so what does that mean, Freddie? I, is uh, everybody that, on the same page? <laughs> never. <laughs> okay, we're gonna have like another session. Okay, gotcha. no, but we're gonna what we're gonna do is go over the ordinance itself. This is not the tree commission conversation. This is okay. a tree <laughs> camp ordinance that exists. So we want to just make sure that we're compliant, and oh, I want to make sure great. that the commission is, is brief, uh, fully on it. August, as long as they're on my page, I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Everyone have a nice holiday. All right. Peace. All right. Take care, guys. Bye-bye.